Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Carey with Church of the Eternal Logos. And tonight, we have a very special stream brought to you by Meta Ninja. Shout out to Meta Ninja. Thank you so much, brother, for sponsoring tonight's stream, on which he asked for a deep dive into what Rosicrucianism is. And so that's what exactly what we're going to do, a historical deep dive. So our conversation tonight is not going to be focused so much on contemporary Rosicrucianism, Rosicrucian orders in the 20th century, the, the famous Rosicrucian uh, order over in California. Nope, 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 nope. None of this stuff. We're going to be focusing on what exactly what's often referred to as the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. And really, this gets going thanks to scholarship from Francis Yates. Francis Yates also wrote the book Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, which is going to play into our conversation tonight because the Rosicrucian Enlightenment is something that is a bit ethereal as which what we're going to discover what Rosicrucian really is. It's not some uh, specific organization that you can just put your finger on. It's sort of mysterious. It's ethereal. It, it's it's an it's a intellectual, philosophical, spiritual movement that um, is influenced by the Italian Renaissance, the German Renaissance, the English Renaissance, the scientific revolution. All these things coalesce together to bring a new conception of spirituality, specifically in regards to Protestantism. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Rosicrucian is, Rosicrucianism is most certainly a Protestant movement. And we're going to see how this coalesces again in what develops into the Thirty Years' War. And the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, the third uh, important text. Uh, you know, again, we're going to go through all this stuff. Going to be a lot of history, a lot of different internet tabs, a lot of different dates. So, buckle in. We're going to be here for a minute. And there's going to be again a lot of dates here. So we're going to be looking at really this movement that gets started in the early 17th century, the early 1600s. And it's in 1614 uh, that the what's called the, the Fama Fraternitatis, the first writing takes place describing this gentleman, Christian Rosenkreutz, who they just claims to have lived during the um, 15th century, that would be the 1400s, and that he traveled all around the world to India and Arabia and to Syria and to Morocco and to Spain. And he, he learned about all these esoteric occult arts. And he then brought this eventually back, disappointed with some of the countries he, he visited. He brought all this incredible spiritual wisdom back to Germany. And, um, and they, I guess he built a house. He, he made uh, instruments, uh, again, indicative of the both, uh, very practical use of these spiritual arts because Rosicrucianism is going to be a syncretic worldview that's going to adopt one Protestantism, but then it's going to add into alchemy, Hermeticism, uh, Kabbalah, uh, Neoplatonism. All these things are going to come together again to describe the spiritual worldview called Rosicrucianism, which even the people that we're going to highlight and say this person was a Rosicrucian, this person was a Rosicrucian, people like Robert Flood, people like Michael Meyer, the real Michael Meyer, not the one that you've seen in Hollywood, the real Michael Meyer, the real alchemist. Um, if you ask these guys, well, are you a Rosicrucian? They say, no, I've, I've, I've never met a Rosicrucian because that's part of the, again, the ethereal mystical dimension of this whole enlightenment movement. And so why it's called, why Francis Yates describes it as the Rosicrucian enlightenment, because this again is taking place in the early 17th century, the early 1600s. Well, what happened in the century prior, that 16th century, you've heard me talk about before, this is the most magical century in European history, the 1500s, the 16th century. Well, what happens? We get the Protestant Reformation. 
15, 17. We get uh, the beginning of the scientific revolution, 1543. We get the uh, development of the Anglican church. I believe that's 1534. So we see, uh, we see this new era in, in Christian approaches. Obviously, Protestantism is, is emerging. We have Lutheranism and Calvinism and, and then Anglicanism. But these Protestant nations, these Protestant groups, some of them developing on Marsilio Ficino, developing on Giovanni Piccadilla Marandola, developing on Henry Cornelius Agrippa, developing on Paracelsian understandings of, of health, healing, medicine. Um, they then developing on Jakob Burma, the German mystic and theologian. They, again, bring all these things together. And what's really interesting is this going to tie into really important historical events. I actually did a speech for Jay Dyer at his event in Florida called Why Do We Call Strange People Bohemians? And part of that presentation is actually going to play front and center into our conversation tonight. Because tonight we're going to be talking about somebody like Frederick the Elector Palatine and his, his marriage to uh, Princess Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of James I, James I, the King of England that takes over after Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of England, who, again, working hand in hand with uh, alchemist, magician, mathematician, philosopher John Dee. Again, John Dee is the basis for the 007, right? He would write these, these letters back to Queen Elizabeth as he traveled the continent of Europe. Um, and he, when he wanted something to only be seen by her eyes, he would sign it double O with a long seven. Well, that's the beginning of this whole double O seven. But John D. at his his workings with Edward Kelly, the philosopher stone, the shoe stone, the Anakian magic, the conversation with angels, all this stuff is going to set a precedent towards the end of the 16th century, moving into the court of Rudolf II. And we'll get into all this stuff. Remember, I've talked about Rudolf II. When we think about those, those kings um, where uh, they have like jokers and, you know, midgets and half, you know, naked breasted women and people juggling in their court. Like it's almost like a DMT trip. Terrence McKenna used to talk about this stuff. Well, Rudolf II, his court, the Habsburg emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, he moved the capital from uh, Venice to um, Prague, and this he developed a sort of alchemical a place in which one he allowed Jews to practice their Kabbalah and, and their Talmudic forms of religion. He allowed uh, alchemists, he allowed astrologers, he allowed uh, divinizers, people practicing magical divination. All these arts were allowed to flourish in the court of Rudolf II, and as that court fell apart as he died and Ferdinand then took over. And then uh, he, again, we get what leads into what's called the 30 years war because the Protestantism there in German, the Protestants, they wanted an alchemical revolution and they almost, almost successfully was a overturning of the Holy Roman empire into an alchemical Protestant um, hermetic worldview. Again, this is the Rosicrucian enlightenment. Uh, this all happens at the beginning of the 17th century. So this is what we're going to be diving into. Guys, smash that like if you're here. Uh, it's going to be um, a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, so I, I really don't even know where to begin. I have so many things to get into because we're going to have to set the historical stage for our conversation because you can't just dive into Frederick the Elector Palatine. You can't just dive into Rudolf II. You can't just dive into the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, beginning with the with the manifestos, without understanding what happened in the Italian Renaissance in the 15th century, the 1400s, Hermeticism, Plato, Neoplatonism, all this stuff being brought in what's called Christian magic. People think, well, Christian magic, what the heck is that? What we're talking about is an actual historical, a syncretic, perennial understanding in which uh, these ideas, again, you can look at the Zohar. This is the Kabbalistic book of Judaism. This stuff gets written in the 13th century on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. Well, during that period, Muslims, Jews, Christians were able to practice their mystical arts. I have a, I actually wrote in one of my papers talking about the use of um, opium and, um, and hashish in 
Spain and how that got brought in through the, the mysticism of the Sufis. Well, this whole idea, what was what was brewing in the 13th century and then the 14th century in Spain uh, gave way to this, what eventually becomes the Prisca Theologia once Marsilio Ficino translate the Hermetic Corpus, but it gave way to the, a presupposition of perennialism, that all these religions have a piece of the truth and they're moving us towards this particular destination. Um, so I'm going to have to go into and, 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 and highlight all this stuff, and we will after once we start really getting into the topic here. But to begin, okay, what is Rosicrucianism? As I said, it's more of a spiritual, a philosophical movement. It's not, it's not the papacy. It's not a centralized organization that's explicit. It's ethereal. You can't put your finger on it. Um, again, the people who I'm going to identify, and again, Francis Yates and most academics would highlight these people were Rosicrucians. They were part of the Rosicrucian. In their own words, they'd say they weren't. But of course, at the same time, they're publishing works promoting Rosicrucianism, celebrating these ideals. And so what is Rosicrucian? It's an embodiment of new spiritual ideals wrapped in the, con wrapped in the, in the uh, framework of Protestant Christianity. And that's where the major players in our conversation are going to be England and Germany. England and Germany. These are the two major nations that are going to be involved during the Rosicrucian Enlightenment because of Protestantism. But also we're going to see Italy plays a part in here because the liberals in Italy weren't very happy with the papacy. And then again, this is all setting the stage for the 30 years war when the Protestants and the Catholics go at it for 30 years battling in Europe. So Rosicrucianism is a sort of spiritual philosophical movement that originated in the early 17th century. And it was based on a set of beliefs and teachings that emphasized the pursuit of spiritual knowledge through direct experience, certain rituals, symbols, and practices. Because this Rosicrucian movement, you have to remember, again, it's syncretic with Jewish Kabbalah. Uh, with Hermeticism and the Hermetic Corpus and the Hermetica, which I'll bring up in our presentation today, which is all about uh, a, a new understanding of how we can theurgically make God act, how we can animate statues, as Hermes teaches Asclepius, how to animate statues with daemons or demons, obviously, from an Orthodox perspective. Um, alchemy. So again, her, or, Rosicrucianism claims that its roots come from Egypt. This gets into a, a, a book or a work called the Emerald Tablet, which was believed to go back to a, a Egyptian deity called Thoth. He was basically a wisdom deity, another one of these wisdom deities. When we look in polytheistic religions, wisdom deities almost always are associated with magic. They're almost asso always associated with language and words and writing. Obviously, again, we've talked about Matt, the, all these things go together, right? Um, and so Thoth, Hermes, and Mercury, these are all sort of a Roman, a Greek, and an Egyptian variation of the same sort of personified concept of a wisdom deity. Um, so this Rosicrucian movement, again, building on basically 150 years before it, is now reforming what Protestant Christianity is. Yes, it's sola scriptura, it's all these different things, but at the intellectual level, as we're going to see, many of the major movers and shakers of the early 17th century, even parts of the end of the 16th century, really in depth or in deep into this movement, okay? And so uh, we can look at alchemy. We can look at these alchemical processes again, Rudolf the second, when John D and we'll describe this whole thing. I want to lay it out more chronologically, but you know, famous John D and Edward Kelly, the criminal um, who again, could look into the shoe stone and communicate with the angels, develop the Anakian language, all this different stuff. When they went to the court of Rudolf the second, he had multiple alchemists there. He had people, again, trying to transmutate lead into gold, but alchemy wasn't just that. When I say alchemy, don't think of it as some materialistic, rational thing where, oh, they're going to put, you know, they're going to transmutate and distillate and, and amalgamate all these different things and turn lead into gold. No, it was more of a spirit. It was a, what I described it as, it's a mystical rationalism. Yes, it is very rational because, again, the scientific revolution is 1543. 
So that's why this Rosicrucian movement is like a Protestant, scientific, magical, mystical coming together of ideas. That's why, again, it's called the Enlightenment, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. It's a set of, of ideas. But because of the 30 Years War, this stuff gets stamped down hard. And eventually, but these ideas don't dissipate. They don't end. And so we see uh, these ideas go underground, but they're uh, proliferated in different ways. And eventually, uh, as Francis Yates would argue, and I would argue as well, that it, it gets brought into a sort of uh, foundation, a, a, a presuppositional foundation that brings forth the Royal Society. Because Rosicrucianism is based on a naturalistic theology or philosophy. It's the, again using all these different worldviews I've already talked about. It's going to observe nature. It's going to come to ultimate conclusions about God and the world. And this is why alchemy is a good thing. Alchemy and these processes, again, these distillations, taking lead and turning into gold, is also a metaphor for your own spiritual reality because Rosicrucianism believed in a sort of spiritual evolution. And, it, and so their whole worldview, as I said, was syncretic, but it was based on an anthropology that man had a divine spark and that divine spark had to be nurtured and developed through spiritual knowledge. So you can see the hint of, of Gnosticism there. You can see it. Then what type of knowledge is it? We can see Hermeticism working. We can see Kabbalistic practices. Why Kabbalah? Because Kabbalah was all about communication with angels, the Sephiroth, stuff like this. And so when uh, Giovanni Piccadilla Marandola developed what was called Christian Kabbalah, which was sort of trying to Christianize these Jewish Kabbalistic traditions that were developed in the Zohar, um, then he, uh, Giovanni Piccadilla Marandola tried to develop this Christian Kabbalah, which was about then reinterpreting the Sephiroth and Jewish Kabbalah in light of what we would call as Orthodox St. Dionysius' um, hierarchy, the divine, the angelic hierarchy. And so it was reinterpreting Jewish Kabbalah within a Christian framework. This was important because as we talked about, again, uh, John D in his Anakian magic con contacting the angels, this is rooted within a Kabbalistic presupposition of, again, com contacting angels for divine knowledge or commanding them to act. Now, again, as Orthodox Christians, we would say, well, that's not very Christian. That sounds like you're contacting demons. Well, yeah, yeah, obviously we would. And um, there were people who speculated that this whole Rosicrucianism thing was a sort of uh, a, a demonic enterprise. And the Catholic Church was not very fond of it at all. And that's, again, why the 30 years war happened. There's more to it. Again, we can talk in the Habsburg powers. We can talk of the Protestant nations, all this different stuff. So what is Rosicrucianism? It's an it's a spiritual philosophical movement that gets developed in the early 17th century, building upon a lot of the major happenings uh, from the beginning of basically the, the mid 1400s, the 15th century through the 16th century. And it is based on uh, this idea that you can gain um, spiritual knowledge, not through authoritative dogma. So you can already see the Protestant rejection of the Pope because Rosicrucianism and many of these movements were explicit that the Pope was the Antichrist. So these movements, because of the Protestant presuppositions of sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, all this different stuff, well, Protestantism by itself, as we've talked about before, before is not very mystical. And so in that absence of a mystical theology in Protestantism, that's where all this other magic gets combined together. Now, eventually this whole movement and its mystical rationalism is just going to become a sort of scientific rationalism. But we could argue that some of the elites and some of the movers and shakers never actually gave up these mystical, magical uh, uh, presuppositions and worldviews. So, um, what did they believe? Well, as I said, spiritual truth can be discovered through direct personal experience. That's that sort of mystical, uh, again, the hermetic. Uh, you could talk about, I, I'm not going to say these people were psychedelic, but you can see the same presupposition of the new age of psychedelic spirituality, that you can gain spiritual knowledge through your own personal experience as opposed to formulated authoritative dogmas. And that's why it was it was defining itself in opposition to the papacy. Its metaphysic is most explicitly Neoplatonic, 
Neoplatonic. So when we're talking about a Rosicrucianism, we're talking about this movement. Again, Neoplatonism really gets going in the Italian Renaissance, right? Because Marsilio Ficino's hermetic worldview, hermeticism is incredibly Neoplatonic. We've talked about Neoplatonism as thinking of it as, a, as, as its cosmological framework, as a dot with concentric circles. Um, and so a dot with concentric circles is the sort of cosmological framework. All these emanations, these concentric circles then are lesser forms of the divine and we got to move back. And that's exactly what these Rosicrucians believe, that they were a divine spark of that one, that singular monad, that, that Neoplatonic monad that that worldview began with. And so through what they would consider divine emanations, right? Plato wasn't talking about divine emanations. He he had a similar worldview. Obviously it's called Neoplatonism. It's building off Plato. But Plato wasn't as explicitly religious as the Neoplatonists were. Well, the Rosicrucians are, again, explicitly religious and spiritual in their framework. So they are this divine spark of this central monad. And then therefore, through the contacting of the angels, Kabbalah, through the hermetic theurgy, through the alchemical empirical processes, through the symbolic understanding of scripture, which is another part of this. They, in, they interpreted the Bible very um, mystically and symbolically. They could then gain spiritual knowledge to move closer to being in contact with that divine one, that divine essence, as they called it. So were these people trinitarians well again this stuff that wasn't as it, they weren't as focused on some of these christian dogmas as we'll see um and they looked at it as very you know mystical and symbolic it's epistemology what's the epistemology right we always talk about a worldview the metaphysic the epistemology and the ethic uh it's epistemology as i described it as a mystical rationalism because the scientific revolution in 1543 gets going and we see the rise of empiricism. We see this elevation of rationalism, right? Um, and so rationalism is on the rise. Descartes is going to play prominently in our uh, conversation today because many people speculated that he himself was a Rosicrucian. And how did he argue he wasn't a Rosicrucian when he went back to Paris? Well, you can see me. You can see me because Rosicrucianism, um, R Rosicrucianism, said that those who are Rosicrucians are invisible. This is, gets tied into what's called the Invisible College, which is what many people, and Francis Yates also believed, is the basis for what becomes the British Royal Society, which is in, still in effect today. Um, and so it talks about how these enlightened brothers, the Rosicrucian Brotherhood, that they were in different nations and that they could be uh, invisible and that they could go from one nation to another. They could instantly travel. Again, this is sort of the metaphors and the accoutrements that were tied to witchcraft at the time. But Rosicrucianism is, expi is explicitly male, mostly. Now, we'll get into Elizabeth Stewart, the daughter of King James I, the King of England, after Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth had no heirs. So we get the King of Scotland. James comes down and becomes the King of England. And he was not very fond of all the magic stuff. And so we're going to talk about how he actually ends up turning his back on his daughter, Elizabeth Stewart, and her husband, Frederick the Elector, Palatine, because they were elevated to become what was called the Winter, well, they were called the Winter King, but they were believed to be the, her, they were going to build a hermetic Protestant dynasty. The Holy Roman Empire was going to go from Catholic to a Protestant hermeticism, alchemy, Rosicrucian, all this different stuff, right? All these things are more explicit and defined. Rosicrucianism, again, is this ethereal thing. But that's why Francis Yates is tying it all together because in the third manifesto, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, it talks about this incredible castle he goes to to witness this mystical marriage. Well, I would agree with Francis Yates. I think what they're talking about is the marriage of Frederick the Elector, the German. Again, he's an elector palatine. What does that mean? He elects the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, okay? He's a German uh, prince, and he marries the daughter, the king of England, both Protestant, interestingly, right? Both Protestant. This was a huge deal, this wedding. And this wedding was seen, you know, all the movers and shakers in the time attended that wedding, and it was believed that they were going to move back to Germany, and when, when Rudolf II died, 
And when it was when it was an opportune time, the Bohemian kingdom, right? Bohemia. This is why we call people Bohemians that are a little weird. Oh, or, you know, they're acting a bit Bohemian. Why? Because the Bohemians were very much interested in all this magic stuff and allowed a sort of different ethos and uh, and cultural standard than some of the Catholic countries or even the more formal Protestant countries. Now, it turns out uh, James the first king of England, he wasn't so much into this as his daughter and his um, his son-in-law believed that he would be because they thought he was going to back them in an opposition to the Habsburg powers. Now, again, I'm talking about all this stuff. Some of you guys are like, what is the hell is he talking about? It's a lot. It's a lot. That's why I said, I don't know how long this thing stream's going to go because there's so much to get into tonight. There's so much to get into. Um, I want to say shout out to AC. He's a new member here on YouTube. God bless you, brother. I uh, hope you uh, hope you enjoy it. Thanks for supporting the stream. I really do appreciate it. And shout out to uh, uh, Willie Jenkins for being a two month member. Um. So so okay. So anyway, <laughs> back to what I was talking about. So the worldview of Rosicrucianism. We talked about how metaphysically it's a Neoplatonic worldview that that focuses on the monad. Um, then we talked about the epistemology. As I said, it's a mystical rationalism. Knowledge was both spiritual and empirical. Okay. So for the Rosicrucians, for the Hermeticists, for the alchemists, knowledge wasn't just physical, like the empiricism that we then grow up in post the enlightenment, which does away with a lot of the spiritual stuff. It, the, the enlightenment does away with superstition, right? But keeps rationalism. We're pre enlightenment. And so what we're talking about is a blending of the superstition and the rationalism. And so for them, this mystical rationalism, knowledge was both spiritual and empirical. That's why alchemy was a scientific, but also a spiritual art. Because when you, when you distillate and you transmutate and you amalgamate and you bifurcate all these different, you are working not only materials, but you're working spiritually. Your soul is part of this process that the alchemist is, is moving through. And so the epistemology then is that knowledge is both spiritual and empirical and is gained by natural observation and experiment. So we can see science and alchemy, spirituality, all this stuff brought together. The ethic is explicitly Protestant. It's, it's a Protestant ethic. Um, so... It's a form of Protestantism. It's pretty straightforward there. It's a Protestant Christian ethic. Obviously, not to the same degree, you know, that other, you know, well, I thought you were talking about all this magic. Yeah, all this magic stuff plus Protestantism. Um, and that's basically their ethic. Their anthropology, as I said, is a man is the divine spark that can be nurtured through practice to obtain spiritual enlightenment. So the Rosicrucian order, these enlightened brothers that we're building upon this knowledge of Christian Rosenkreutz, which is not a historical figure. I do not believe. Some people claim it is. I do not. I do not believe Christian Rosenkreutz was a real person. I believe it was a fictitious person developed through these, the, 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 the Fama Fraternitatis, the Confessio Fraternitatis, the uh, alchemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. These three manifestos lay out Rosicrucianism. And the first one, the, the Fama Fraternitatis, lays out Christian Rosenkreutz in this journey he has through all these different nations, collecting all this secret spiritual knowledge, uh, which is one of the interesting things is he goes all these places except Jerusalem, because again, Rosicrucianism is building upon this presupposition that was developed in the Italian Renaissance called the Prisca Theologia. And this got developed because of beliefs that Her Hermes Trismegistus was a historical figure, which he is not, but they believed that he was when they translated the Hermetic Corpus. And because they believed he, he was a, a historical figure, they believed he predated Moses. And they had a presupposition called classis, uh, classicism, where the older something was, the better it was. So the older something was, the truer it was. Therefore, the contemporary Catholic Church was less true than the ancient wisdom of the ancients that had to do with magic and summoning and uh, astrology, 
all this different stuff, alchemy. These things were more true because they were older. That was a presupposition of the Renaissance, which, of course, totally gets shaken up by Isaac Casabon in the 17th century when he redates the Hermetic Corpus and shows this is actually post-Christianity. This is this is newer than Christianity, which is part of why then this whole thing falls apart to some degree, to some degree. Because eventually this Rosicrucianism, it's not Freemasonry, right? Freemasonry is an institution. You can go and knock on the building of Freemasonry. Now you can with Rosicrucian. There's Rosicrucian orders and stuff. But when we're talking about the 17th century, there was no knock, knock, knock. Oh, I'm at the doors of the Rosicrucians. No, it was nobody knew where it was exactly. But as Francis Yates argues, she thinks it gets blended into Freemasonry or was the basis for Freemasonry. Now, I believe Freemasonry was rooted also in the Knights Templars. You've heard me talk about this before, that the Knights Templars, the development of Baphomet, going to the Holy Land, getting in, in, again initiated into these sort of Gnostic mystical rites and rituals, that they also were part of the development because in 13, was it 1314, I think, the Knights Templars, um, their leader gets killed in the Inquisition. And so then he flees, they flee north to uh, Scotland. And that's where for basically Scottish Freemasonry gets going, because I would argue that Scottish Freemasonry is the continuation of some of these ancient Gnostic traditions blended with what becomes the, the Rosicrucianisms as well, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. So, um, so it's anthropology is a man is a divine spark tied to a Neoplatonic worldview. And then I said it's biblical hermeneutics interprets the Bible symbolically, interprets the Bible symbolically. So, um, yeah. So with that being said, guys, smash that like. We're going to get more in depth into all this stuff as we move forward with this stream. There's going to be a lot of dates, a lot of names, names that you're probably familiar with, but you really don't know what they did. So we're going to try to unpack all this stuff. And so, as I said, now Rosicrucianism in the 20th century, you can go to a Rosicrucian temple or a Rosicrucian order in California. They're all over the United States. They're even in Europe. But that's not, that is not the same thing that we're describing in this beginning. I want to focus more on the his, historicity and the historical development of Rosicrucianism, really uh, only within in, into the 17th century. Everything 18, 19, 20th, 21st century, I really am not going to even address that because there's too much material to even get into. So we're really going to be focusing on the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century. Um, really the 15th, 16th, and 17th. They only say the 14th because that's where we get the, the Zohar, perennialism, and all this different stuff. Um, um, so anyways, guys, smash that like. Um, I want to make a few quick announcements before we get into things. Um, first, what I want to do is tell you guys that, hey, we got some new content over at the website. So uh, if you guys haven't become a website member, I would highly recommend that you guys do. Uh, this is the website right here. Again, the, the full stream that I showed the other night, uh, I showed a clip of, I premiered it over on this channel. Here it is, the inverted man, Lil Nas X and demonic corporatism, full streams over at the website for people. Here's a stream on the, the sort of psychedelic Jesuit caves that most people hadn't heard of. Here's a video on insanity, demonic possession, and patristic thought. Here's a video on Christian monarchy. Um, I also just recorded another video for members that will be I'll be um, I'll be showing tomorrow or I'll upload that tomorrow. And that is on Justinian's reconstruction of the Roman Empire. So I have a whole it's an hour long video only for members. And it's basically describing uh, what we would call St. Justinian as Orthodox, but uh, Emperor Justinian and his re. Uh, the, the the reconquering of the Roman lands. And so it's talking about uh, the Battle of Dara, the, the Battle of regaining Rome, of Carthage, of, you know, there's battles with the Ost Ostrogoths, with the Persian Empire, all that different stuff that's covered. That will be up over for members tomorrow. So again, if you haven't become a website member, I would highly recommend you do. I really, really, really would appreciate that. That's one of the best um, uh, one of the best ways to, uh, support the, uh, the channel in my work. 
And so you can do so by again, going right here. Here's the, here is the website page and we have all different types of payments. Again, you can go ahead, you'll get two free months if you purchase the annual. So if you just sign up for the annual subscription right away, you'll get two free months. Here is the link for uh, becoming a website member. Um, or you can pay monthly, however you prefer, or I have nobody had purchased this yet, but if you want to really help me out, you can become a lifetime member for a thousand dollars, $1,000. You can become a lifetime website member. As long as I have website content, you will have access to it. Um, so if that's something you'd be interested in, go support me there. Also, if anybody would like to purchase a one-on-one -on -one session, uh, you can do so with this link right here. Now I got to say, I'm not doing any one-on-ones this week, and I will be leaving for Germany May 2nd, May 2nd. So I'll be going to Germany, which is interesting because it actually ties into some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today, like the Heidelberg Castle. The Heidelberg Castle is the castle that Frederick the Elector Palatine and Elizabeth Stewart, when they get married and they come back to Germany, and they're developing and growing in the sort of uh, hermetic alchemical Rosicrucian movement, anticipating for him to become the new king of Bohemia. Um, they lived in the Heidelberg Castle, which is the castle that, again, Francis Yates speculates. It's the Heidelberg Castle, which is the castle described in the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. I will be going with my girlfriend to the Heidelberg Castle, so I'm very excited about that. Um, and I'll be in Southern Germany where some of this stuff is taking place. So I'm excited about that, but that's going to be, I'll be in Germany from May 2nd to the 16th. I'm hoping to maybe do a couple of streams while I'm there. We'll find out. I'm not sure. Um, but I definitely, definitely hope so. Um, also, uh, if you would like, you could, uh, help me out by sponsoring a stream. And so if you, uh, have another topic again, major, major shout out goes on to my brother, Meta Ninjas, Meta Ninjas sponsored tonight's stream. Again, he wanted to know what exactly Rosicrucianism is. And that's a big question. And this stream actually took probably some of the most research to do. Not that it wasn't a topic I'm unfamiliar with. It's a topic I'm quite familiar with. And that's why I really wanted to dive into it because it's actually going to play real nice with a stream I have this Thursday evening with Father Deacon Dr. Ananias on humanism. And so we'll be tying into humanism and we're going to see tonight how, um, again, hermeticism, alchemy, this Rosicrucian movement re-elevates the concept of man as a sort of pinnacle of creation. Not that we aren't already in a Christian worldview, but it you can see the, the, the presuppositions of humanism really get developed. So we'll be diving into philosophical humanism with Father Deacon Thursday evening. And as of right now, I need to confirm tomorrow. I need to confirm tomorrow. I'll send emails out in the morning. Jonathan Paggio should be on Friday morning at 10 a.m. So it's an early stream, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Jonathan Paggio. It will be a live stream. It will be live. Um, unfortunately, last time we were going to do a stream, he was not able to make it. There is a a scheduling mix up uh, with, on his part. So um, I am hoping I'll message again. I'll message his assistant tomorrow to double check that he is still ready to go for a stream Monday or Friday morning, Friday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Very early. If you guys are on West Coast time real early, we're talking 7 a.m. If you're in Europe, you're going to be real happy because that's going to be right in the center of the day for you. So um so that's going to be Friday. And then uh, we have another sponsored stream with our beloved friend, Bayslit Analyzer. Shout out to uh, Aaron. We have a, another, he sponsored a stream looking into um, Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. So the first Indiana Jones. So me and BLA Sunday night at seven o'clock PM Eastern Standard Time, we will be doing another movie breakdown, another movie review of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones. So that should be a lot of fun. Oh, shout out to Pottery in Central. Uh, let's see, what's the fullness of your name? Pottery. Um, yeah, Pottery just, uh, they just gifted five memberships. Five memberships. Thank you so much. Uh, Pottery, I can't see the fullness of your name, is it? 
Hmm. Anyways, thank you so much, Pottery. I I, I want to see where you're in Central at. Um, <laughs> I apologize. I can't see it on my end. Uh, let me see if I go like this. Nope. I cannot see what your full name is, Pottery. But thank you so much for gifting. Oh, in Central Washington, Pottery in Central Washington. Thank you guys very much. Pottery in Central Washington, thank you so much for gifting five memberships here to uh, the YouTube channel. God bless you. Thank you very, 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 very much. Wow. Um, so shout out to Pottery in Central Washington. I'm in Moses Lake, Washington. My name is Josh uh, Arledge. Well, shout out to Josh Arledge in, in uh, Moses Lake, Washington. God bless you, brother. And thank you so much for supporting the stream. I really do appreciate it. And everybody give him a special thanks because five people just got memberships. Um, <laughs> Jesse says, I'm not used to receiving gifts. Well, God bless you, Josh Arledge. Uh, thank you very, very much for the support, my man. Um, so... Okay, so let's see here. That is going to do it for the announcements. Uh, we kind of covered all of that, covered those bases. Now let's get into, uh, shoot, where do we start? Where do we start? I guess we'll start with, uh, oh, wow, Pottery in Central Washington. Thank you so much, man. He throws in a $20 sticker. A $20 sticker uh, and uh, just says, you are amazing. Well, thank you so much, man. God bless you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very kind. I truly do appreciate it. I know everybody on the channel appreciates the uh, memberships that you just gifted, and I do truly do appreciate the $20 Super Chat. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So where do we start today's conversation? It's hard to say. I'm going to begin with the Italian Renaissance. Um, let me know. Does, does this does this angle look better for you guys? I, it's probably easier to read when I do this than um, this, this, or this. You guys let me know which one you like the best. I think just because there's going to be so much reading, I'll do some of this. I'll, I'll hop in and out whenever I'm talking, but... We can't talk about Rosicrucianism without first beginning with the Italian Renaissance. What happened in the Italian Renaissance? Well, we don't have to get into all these different details. I just bring this up to highlight most specifically, uh, let's see here, this gentleman here, Marsilio Ficino. And so Marsilio Ficino, um, as we see, was an Italian scholar, Catholic priest, and one of the most influential humanist philosophers of the early Italian Renaissance. He was an astrologer, a reviver of Neoplatonism in touch with the major academics of his day, and the first translator of Plato's complete extant works into Latin. His Florentine Academy, an attempt to revive Plato's Academy, influenced the direction and tenor of the Italian Renaissance and the development of European philosophy. So, Marcelo Ficino is going to be very important in regards to the translation of the Hermetic Corpus because, um, you know, Cosimo de' Medici, when the so the oh, well, her first let me let me lay out the so during the 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 Council of Florence right that was through 1438 through 1440 we're Orthodox so the Council of Florence is something that we should all know as Orthodox Christians this was an attempt to reconcile the schism between East and West now 200 years prior the Catholics went and sacked Constantinople okay now the there was an attempt to reconcile uh, the two churches in which some of the bishops went ahead and agreed to it. But when they went back to their Orthodox lands, they said, hell no, what are you talking about? They rejected them. They kicked those bishops out of the church, the priests. And um, they said, no, the schism is not healed and mended. And so what this did though, this council of Florence, it brought a lot of Greek literature that the Byzant the, that Byzantium had, such as Plato. Byzantium had the full works of Plato. The West, the Latin West, only had the full works of Aristotle. This is why scholasticism, the what which breeds, bleeds into and breeds uh, philosophy, 
was really Aristotelian. This is why scholastic Catholic theology is very Aristotelian. Somebody like Thomas Aquinas, very Aristotelian. He, he was focused on um, Aristotle and Dionysius. Those were the huge, huge ancient figures for uh, Thomas Aquinas. Well, the, the East had Plato. And so somebody like uh, Gemistus Plethon, he brought uh, some of these texts from the Byzant Byzantium into the Latin West. And Cosimo de' Medici, again, the Medicis were one of the wealthiest families in the world. Arguably, Cosimo de' Medici was arguably, if not the wealthiest man in the world outside the emperor of China. And so they had an, an incredible amount of wealth in Florence, Italy. And he commissioned Marsilio Ficino to begin translating Plato. And he wanted it done. And that's where they talk about the Platonic Academy that Marsilio Ficino was getting ready to establish. Well, then they got a hold of the Hermetic Corpus. And as I said, they believed Hermes Trismegistus, the supposed author of the Hermetic Corpus, to be older than Moses. And the Renaissance, again, what was the Renaissance? Well, it was a belief uh, in getting back to the classical period, classical education, classical art, right? All this different stuff. And so, um, so the Italian Renaissance laid this presupposition for older things must be better things. We, they, that Europe sort of lost its way, if you will. And so believing that Herm Hermes Trismegistus was actually older than Moses was a huge deal. And therefore, Cosmo de Medici said, Marsilio, begin translating that now. Stop Plato. We'll read Plato later. Translate the Hermetic Corpus, which he did. And this was the basis. Again, Marsilio Ficino sort of synthesized um, Orphic hymns, um, Hermetic forms of theurgy and conjuration with Neoplatonic worldview cosmology and concepts of theurgy that you can basically command God to act. You can perform certain rituals. That's what theurgy is. And it's an important theological term. If you don't have that in your repertoire, get it. Theurgy. So Marcelo Ficino, and this led into another uh, figure, Giovanni Piccadella Marandola, who he was also part of the Italian Renaissance. He was a student of Marsilio Ficino, and he is famed for the events in 1486 when at an age of 23, he proposed to defend 900 theses on religion, philosophy, natural philosophy, and magic against all comers, for which he wrote the oration on the dignity of man. And I don't have that next to me. I have it over there on the shelf, but it was a major, major work. Um, in a key text of the Renaissance humanism and what has been called the Hermetic Reformation. He was the founder of the tradition of Christian Kabbalah, right? Here it is, Christian Kabbalah, a key tenet of the early modern Western, Western esotericism. Uh, the 900 Theses was first printed, uh, was the first printed book to be universally banned by the Catholic Church, right? This is before the Protestant Reformation. And so he's sometimes seen as a proto-Protestant because his 900 theses anticipated many Protestant views. Now, um, so he was very much in magic. He died at a very young age. As you can see here, he died at the age of 31. Uh, again, according to the course that I took in Western esoteric uh, traditions, many believed that Picadella Mirandola was a closeted homosexual. And the reason why he died at such a young age was actually from poisoning in a stab wound, according to recent, um, I don't want to say archaeologies, but discoveries of his corpse, looking at his, his, his body when it was buried and claiming that there was a potentially a stab wound and that somebody walked in on him, um, potentially having relations with his boyfriend or another man of some sort. OK, so that's Picadella Mirandola. OK, well, another major influence was the English Renaissance. And we're going to talk about this is really going to focus on. Um, so this is the early 16th century, the early 1500s. So the, the so the English Renaissance is different from the Italian Renaissance in several ways. The dominant art forms of the English Renaissance were literature and music, visual arts and the English Renaissance were much less significant than the Italian Renaissance. The English period began far later than the Italian, which is moving into mannerism and the Baroque by the 1550s or earlier. Okay, so the English Renaissance, we're going to see John Dee play a major part in the sense of his knowledge base, his mathematics, his inventions, and his ability to cast uh, astrological readings, right, for different uh, various powerful courts. 
So John D and his magical capabilities were uh, very important, and it was all tied to Queen Elizabeth of England. See, Queen Elizabeth and John D had a very special relationship, not a sexual relationship. I'm not saying that at all, but a very special relationship in the sense that she supported all of his magical efforts. And she supported him going to the continent of Europe, again, to go to various courts of different kings and emperors um, to, again, cast their, their astrological readings or whatnot. And then he would write back to her. And that's why if you've ever even, you know, uh, Jay Dyer has done a lot of work re regarding uh, the Bond series and 007. That's why John D. the Magician is actually the first 007 because he would write, sign his letters double O with a elongated seven and send them back to Elizabeth so that she would know they better have not been opened because they're signed 007. That means John D. wrote it and he only wants me to see it. She was very supportive of his magical arts, which she had no heirs. Queen Elizabeth of England had no heirs. And so because of that, that brings in uh, King James the first to become, he was the King of Scotland. He's one of the Stuarts. He gets now brought in, he gets coronated as the King of England. He's not in favor of magic. And this is going to play really important into our tale of Rosicrucianism. The German Renaissance, also uh, very important. Um, so the German Renaissance, part of the Northern Renaissance, was a cultural and artistic movement that spread among German thinkers of the 15th and 16th century, which developed from the Italian Renaissance. Many areas of the arts and sciences were influenced, notably the spread of Renaissance humanism to various German states and principalities. There were many advances made in the fields of architecture, the arts, and the sciences. Germany produced two developments that were to dominate the 16th century all over Europe, printing and the Protestant Reformation. And that's going to be huge. And that's why uh, that's why Rosicrucianism is going to play a very important. We have to remember Rosicrucianism is a German. It, again, it really gets going in Germany, but it has ties all the way back you know, to England very specifically. So it's a very English German movement. But Germany had the printing presses and we're going to find that in Oppenheim, uh, Germany. This was really the heart of, of the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, the Rosicrucian movement, because they had a very sympathetic individual who would print their books, print their works, print their manifestos, print all these things, print their engravings of Michael Meyer and Robert Flood, which we're going to look at. And so Oppenheim, Germany was a central point for all this. So um, the German Renaissance, we see Humanism, again, already moved through the German Renaissance, which is going to be important as a presupposition for um, as a, an important presupposition for R R Rosicrucianism and uh, all these sort of Protestant magical movements. Um, so I just highlight this. We don't need to go into too much of this. You know, Johann Reuchlin, he was also very much interested in some of these languages. He studied uh, it you know, Greek and Hebrew languages aiming at purifying Christianity and encountering, uh, but encountered resistance from the church. Uh, Albert Dürer, if you're not familiar with him, very important artist. Um, he's probably the most significant German Renaissance artist, Albert Dürer. Uh, from my understanding, one of his big contributions was like perspective um, within paintings and stuff like that. But again, I'm no specialist there. Then we also have another movement. So we have the Italian the English and the German Renaissance. Like I said, remember, our main points of emphasis, England, Germany, and then at the end tail of this, we're going to see Italy as well. But we have then the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution, 1543 through 1687. This is the Copernican revolution, the age of enlightenment. And so what do we see? The scientific revolution was a series of events that marked the emergence of modern science during the early modern period when developments in mathematics, physics, astronomy, biology, and chemistry transformed the views of society about nature. The scientific revolution took place in Europe starting toward the second half of the Renaissance period. Um, you know, the era, the scientific Renaissance focused on some degree of recovering the knowledge of the ancient. So we can already see that Renaissance, right? Because it's all about reaching back to the ideal past and recovering that something that we lost on the way. Right. And so, they were covering that knowledge of the ancients as is considered to have culminated in Isaac Newton's 1687 public publication of the Principia, which formulated the laws of motion and universal gravitation. 
thereby completing the synthesis of a new cosmology. Now, was um, was Isaac Newton uh, an occultist? Was he a mystic? Was he an esotericist? Well, many people would argue he was an alchemist. Many people argue that he was very knowledgeable about all this stuff. Uh, was he a Rosicrucian? I don't know. But was he probably aware of all these things and these ideas? Absolutely. Because uh, our six again, the 17th century is what we're focusing on today. So 1687, his Principia, that's right in the ballpark of our conversation today. Okay, then we have the Hermetica. Remember, this is the work that Marsilio Ficino, that Italian, translated. And this is around the 1450s, 1450s, I believe, um, that Marsilio Ficino translated. Let me see if I can get a specific. I'm all about dates. Dates help me put it all together in my mind. Marsilio Ficino, uh, let's see. Where did he translate the Hermetic Corpus? Uh yeah, so even some have alleged that Ficino himself was a homosexual. You, you'll find some of this stuff. Um, no. Anyway, I'm not seeing it specifically, but I believe it was in the 1450s through the 1460s that he was translating the Hermetic Corpus. And so this is the Hermetica. Our text attributed to the legendary Hellenistic figure Hermes Trismegistus, a syncretic combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. Now, remember, we have the emerald tablets here, which they also were believed. So the Rosicrucians claim to have emerged not only from the Hermetica, but also they, they go all the way back to Egypt. And so the emerald tablets, which they would highlight, is a compact and cryptic hermetic text. It was highly regarded by Islamic and European alchemists as the foundation of their art. Though attributed to legendary Hellenistic figure Hermes Trismegistus, the text of the Emerald Tablet first appears in a number of early medieval Arabic sources, the oldest which dates to the 18th and early 19th century. Okay. Now, again, some of the, some of the sources I use for today's stream, again, we have... Francis Yates, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, which I would recommend. I'd highly recommend. Um, I also use the, the Western Esoteric Traditions, a book by Goodrick Clark, uh, Goodrick Clark, Oxford Press. Um, also, some of you guys used to see this back here on my shelf back in the day. I now have it set up with some of the other books over there. This is a dictionary of Gnosis and Western Esotericism. This is a very uh, thick book. It's a dictionary, but it's incredibly well uh, comprehensive. So a dictionary of Gnosis and Western Esotericism, which they have multiple sections on Rosicrucianism, tracking it through the centuries and some of the major players and shakers. Also, um, another work that if you want to learn more about this stuff, you could look at this one right here. This is uh, Real History of the Rosicrucians by A.E. Waite. He himself was a Occultist, I guess you could say. Um, I believe he was a Mason. He was in the Hermetic Golden Dawn. Um, and so he has his work on the history of the Rosicrucians as well, if that's something you want to. And you can get this free. So if you put in real history of the Rosicrucians, A.E. Wait, you should be able to see a link where you can download the PDF. That's what I did. Also, um, I have a book that's not specifically on um, Rosicrucianism, you would say, but it's a book that uh, um, is very, very interesting. And that is transhumanism, the history of a dangerous idea. Now this book, uh, actually does, it's really not till the end that it gets into, um, Rosicrucian, I mean, uh, transhumanism. What it does is, is trace like, here we go. Table of contents, magic and mysticism, there's a whole chapter on the Rosicrucians. Um, Isaac Luria, uh, one of the Kabbalists that developed, he was essential for the development of uh, Zionism. Uh, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, the Age of Unreason, Scottish Freemasonry. Anyways, eventually it gets into, um, you know, the Church of Satan, computer, Discordia, all this different stuff. It's quite an interesting read. It's depth. It's in. It's very in depth. But um, where's your crew? So here we go. According to Rosicrucian legend, Order of Crusading Knights, known as the Templars, the Order of Solomon. Yeah. So you can see 
Uh, he talks a lot about this stuff, alchemy, useful arts. This was another book that I looked into uh, for tonight's stream. So now let's go back to where we were with all the wiki pages. Um, okay, so we were looking at the Emerald Tablet. You get it. Hermetica, the Emerald Tablet. Another important point for today is the Biblico uh, Platina. This is actually the Heidelberg Library. Okay, this was Heidelberg was the most important library of the German Renaissance, numbering approximately 5,000 printed books and 5,524 manuscripts. The Bibliotheca was a prominent prize captured during the Thirty Years' War. That's because the Catholics hated because this this library specifically was filled with occult texts. Because again, remember Rudolf II, um, this whole movement, and and it got going as as Francis Yates claims. It's because John D and Edward Kelly went to Germany, went to the court of Rudolf II, and he they she argues this really set off this new precedent for esoteric knowledge and magical occult hermetic understandings. Rudolf II was already much uh, in favor of all this stuff, but uh, the Heidelberg Library, which is again Heidelberg, is where we're going to see Frederick the Elector Palatine in. Um, Elizabeth Stewart moved to, they burn all this stuff down. So unfortunately, tons of this stuff is lost to history. We actually don't know, but it was a very, very important library that had a lot of controversial uh, books and stuff that we no longer have. Now, again, something that I also highlighted that is very important is um, the Prisca Theologia. This is that presupposition is the doctrine that asserts that a single true theology exists, which threads all religions and which was anciently given by God to humans. Now they believed it was given to Hermes. The term Prisca Theologia appears to have first been used by Marsilio Ficino in the 15th century. Ficino and Giovanni Piccadella Marandola endeavored to reform the teachings of the Catholic Church by means of the writings of the Prisca Theologia, which they believed was reflected in Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, and that Chaldean oracles, among other sources. Enlightenment thought, like Prisca Theologia, tended to view the religion as a cultural variation of a common theme, but tended to denigrate Prisca Theologia along with the rest of revealed religion. This doctrine of a Prisca Theologia is held among the Rosicrucians, Rosicrucianism. Prisca theologia is related to the concept of perennial philosophy, but an essential difference is that Prisca theologia is understood to have existed in pure form only in ancient times and has since undergone continuous decline and dilution. Perennial philosophy asserts that the true religion periodically manifests itself in different times, places, forms, potentially even modern times. So another important concept as we move into uh, our conversation today. So Giovanni Piccadilla Mirandola. Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa is another one of these occultists. Again, you look at his datings, that's 1486 to 1535. So this is well before the 17th century, the 1600s. But he wrote uh, famously, again, he was a German Renaissance polymath, physician, polymath, uh, polymath, legal scholar, soldier, theologian, and occult writer. Agrippa, which I have over here, is a ginormous text called The Three Books of Occult Philosophy, published in 1533, drew heavily upon Kabbalah, Hermeticism, and Neoplatonism. His book was widely influential among esotericists of the early modern period and was deemed heretical by Inquisitor of Cologne. So this is before, um, well, this is right after, yeah, published 1533. This is right after the Protestant Reformation. Remember, 1517, we have the Protestant Reformation. Major, major date. If you don't have 1517 in your mind, stamp that damn thing in your mind. 1517, 1054, Great Schism, 1517, Protestant Reformation, important. Um, Paracelsus, another one of these very important figures that is going to influence uh, Rosicrucianism, okay? He uh, was a Swiss physician, alchemist, lay theologian, philosopher of the German Renaissance, he was a pioneer in several aspects of medical revolution, um, emphasizing the value of observation and combination with received wisdom. So we can already see some of the presuppositions that I talked about with Rosicrucianism privileging the direct experience over these dogma or these authoritative dogmas, right? He is credited as the father of toxicology. Paracelsus is also the first one to develop pills, dissolvable capsules that you could swallow minerals in. Um, 
Paracelsus is credit is credit as the first one. He's also the first one to develop what's called uh, laudanum, which is a opium al- alcohol tincture. So you basically you can de- you can change the the metrics of it, but it was a way to deal with pain. And so you basically, I don't know what the percentage is, 20% opium or 80% alcohol, whatever. But uh, I don't know. Some of you wildcats out there may have actually drank laudanum or uh, dealt with it. I have not. I've never been exposed to it. But Paracelsus also invented that. Okay. So Paracelsus had this incredibly mystical um, worldview where he was adapting sort of Galen's, Galen, the ancient... uh, doctor, uh, medical man, reinterpreting it in this hermetic framework. Okay. Cause look at his dates, 1493 through 1541. So he lived through the Protestant reformation. He was totally, uh, during that time, during these Renaissance periods, he himself was uh, very influenced by these things. And so he sort of synthesizes alchemy, medicine, hermeticism, Christian Protestant theology, all this stuff comes together in Paracelsus, who's going to have a very important effect on all these people we're going to highlight as Rosicrucians. Paracelsus was also had a substantial influence as a prophet or diviner, his prognostications being studied by Rosicrucians in the 1600s. Paracelsianism is an early modern medical movement inspired by the study of his works. Okay, next one. Um, Jakob Burma, Jakob Burma. So I don't speak German, but I know that you're technically supposed to pronounce his name Burma. Uh, so Jakob Burma was a German philosopher, Christian mystic, and Lutheran Protestant theologian. Again, look at his look at his dates. Now he actually lived. He died in 1624. So he's right in that period of the Rosicrucianism because the Battle of White Mountain. Let me see if I got that. The Battle of White Mountain. Uh, here we go. The Battle of White Mountain is the battle in which Frederick the Elector Palatine, right here, Frederick the Elector Palatine, who is going to become the Hermetic, the Protestant Hermetic King of Bohemia, right? He's going to establish this new revolution, this new reformation, this this world altering uh, change where the you know the Habsburg powers were going to be dethroned as a European power. It lasted for one winter. That's why he's often him and his wife, Elizabeth Stewart, right here, Queen of Bohemia. uh, Elizabeth Stewart were um, just called the king. They're called the winter king and queen. That's commonly what they were referred to because, unfortunately, they only reigned as the king and queen of Bohemia for one winter because the Battle of White Mountain ended that. The Battle of White Mountain was an important battle, early stage of the Thirty Years' War. It led to the defeat of Bohemian Revolt and ensured Habsburg control over the next 300 years. An army of 21,000 Bohemians and mercenaries under Christian of Anault, who was the right-hand man to Frederick the Elector, okay, we'll highlight him in a second, was defeated by 23,000 men that combined armies of Ferdinand II, Holy Roman Emperor. Now, interestingly, one of the guys that was in that Habsburg army is Rene Descartes. And so we'll come to that, too, as as uh, Francis Yates highlights. It looked like Rene was, even though, again, he's the father of rational philosophy, right? Uh, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Um, many people speculated that he himself was um, a Rosicrucian, which he denied publicly. However, he, does, he did go back and forth in correspondence with Elizabeth Stewart because Frederick the Elector eventually dies. He dies... Um, where does he die? He dies in 1632. Okay, 1632. He was only 36 years old, unfortunately. Um, Frederick the Elector dies. His wife lived, and with the rest of the family, she stayed there in the Hogue. And interestingly, when I believe wasn't Rene Descartes, wasn't his main work also called the Principia or something like that? I forget. But anyways, he dedicated one of his biggest works in philosophy to. He called Elizabeth the Queen of Bohemia, which was a title not bestowed on her because they lost at the Battle of White Mountain. So that showed that Rene Descartes was quite sympathetic, quite sympathetic to the Queen of Bohemia, which again led more further speculation that maybe Rene Descartes himself was also a Rosicrucian. So uh, 
Yeah. So let me say then a little bit about, let's see. Um, I don't even know where to start. Yeah, We're already an hour, an hour and a, you know, quarter of an hour over. It's an hour and 17 minutes. And I feel like I haven't even gotten into it yet. So Paracelsus, Yaka Burma. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, here we go. Rudolph the second. So here's, this is okay. Let's start here. This is a good play. Well, we've already started, but let's continue here. Rudolf the second was the King of Hungary and Croatia and the Archduke of Austria. He was a member of the house of the Habsburg. Uh, Rudolf's legacy has traditionally been viewed in three ways, an ineffectual ruler whose mistakes led directly to the 30 years war. Hey, and that, why did it lead to the 30 years war? Because he allowed the alchemists, the Protestants, the Hermeticists, the Neoplatonists, the Jews, and their Kabbalah, all this stuff thrived in his court. See, right, even right here it says, um, which led more authority to his brother. Under his reign, there was a policy of toleration towards Judaism in which he allowed Kabbalah to flourish. Um, and so he, again, was a very, very eccentric guy, uh, very eccentric guy. Let's see if we have anything here on the occult. Here we go. The occult sciences. Astrology and alchemy were regarded as mainstream scientific fields in Renaissance Prague. Remember, he moved the capital from Venice to Prague. Venice to Prague. This was a huge, uh, a huge deal. Let me see if that is, where's that at? Let me just command find Prague. Um, there we go. He moved the court to Prague. Now, I believe it was Venice uh, before. So he moves it to Prague. Why? Because he loved it. It was, a, again, a, a city of very interesting. He basically had his own ethos there. He, he was not very much interested in the papacy and what they had to say. So astrology, alchemy, okay. Uh, we're in the Renaissance in Prague, and Rudolf was a firm devotee of both. Again, the Catholic Church was in opposition to this stuff, but at the same time, as we see right here, his religion was Catholicism. He was part of the House of the Habsburgs. He was the Holy Roman Emperor. But he was giving lip service and, and allowing a culture to flourish. This is, the, this is essential for what's called the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Rosicrucianism would not exist without the court of Rudolf II moving in the ways that it did. And so Rudolf was a firm devotee of both. His lifelong quest was to find the Philosopher's Stone, which, again, we'll get tie into John D. here in a second. John D. and Edward Kelly claimed that they had. And Rudolf spared no expense in bringing Europe's best alchemists to court, such as Edward Kelly and John D. We'll get to them in just a second. Rudolf even performed his own experiments in a private alchemy, uh, alchemy laboratory. When Rudolf was a prince, Nostradamus prepared a horoscope, which was dedicated to him as prince and king. In the 1590s, Michael uh, Sindivogius um, was active at, I don't even know who that guy is, uh, was a, po okay, here we go. Here's somebody I'm not familiar with. He was a Polish alchemist, philosopher, medical doctor, pioneer of chemistry and developed ways of purification and creation of acids, metals, and chemical compounds. Michael Sindivogius. Um, okay. He discovered that air is not a single substance. It contains a life-giving substance later called oxygen 170 years before uh, Shelley's discovery of the element. He correctly identified this food of life with gas, also oxygen given off by heating uh, nitri. Uh, the substance, the central nitri had a central position in Sindivogius's schema of the universe. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Rudolf gave Prague a mystical reputation that persists in part to this day with Alchemist Alley on the grounds of Prague Castle, a popular visiting point place for tourist attractions. And I really want to go to Prague. It's one of the things I hope I can make it to Prague someday because of all this history. Rudolf was a patron of the occult sciences along with this and his practice of tolerance towards Jews. It was during his reign that the legend of the Golem of Prague was established. The Golem was, of course, one of the, uh, which it was one of the rabbis that, uh, yeah, in the late 16th century, rabbi of Prague, 
According to Moment Magazine, the golem is a highly mutable metaphor with seemingly limitless symbolism. Some people believed it literally. Um, Judah Leo Ben Basilel. Okay. Anyway. So, okay. Next person, though, is John D. So, for the Renaissance, for the, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment to occur, what Francis Yates argues is that towards the end of the 16th century, so before the manif before the, the Famas, right? So before, um, let's see, before we have Rosicrucianism, Fama Fraternitatis, we have the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which is the third one. There should be, there it is, the Confessio Fraternitatis. So it goes, the Fama Fraternitatis, 1614, the Confessio Fraternitatis, 1615, and then the um, Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, um, 1616. So three years in a row, 14, 15, 16. There we have these what are called the Rosicrucian manifestos before those even exist. Okay. What what Francis Yates argues is that John D and his workings with Edward Kelly. So if you don't if you're not familiar, okay, let, we gotta say a little bit about John D. Was an English mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, teacher, occultist, and alchemist. He was the court astronomer for an advisor to Elizabeth I and spent much of his time on alchemy, divination, and hermetic philosophy. As an antiquarian, he had one of the largest libraries in England at the time. It's true. As a political advisor, he advocated the foundation of English colonies and the New World to form a British empire, which will this will tie into Francis Bacon and his New Atlantis, which I recently just got, by the way, because I'm, I'm reading that for... Um, so here's this is actually three different peoples. This is uh, more Bacon and Neville, um, but the New Atlantis part right here that is Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, which he argues for a sort of scientific, rational utopia that he calls Atlantis, that he identifies basically with America, and that is going to be ruled by Rosicrucians. Rosicrucians, these people who are spiritual, new spiritual approach wrapped in Protestantism, wrapped in a sort of mystical rationalism, which allowed for, again, science to continue to develop. So Rosicrucianism is very much in line with the scientific revolution. These people that we're going to highlight, they're not against, you know, John Dee's not against science. He invented some of the, uh, the navigational devices of Sir Francis Drake. If Sir Francis Drake wouldn't have been able to sail around uh, didn't he sail around? I believe he was the first one to get over to California. The He used navigational devices created by John D. You see, the scientific revolution and the use of science is tied to their spiritual worldview. D eventually left Elizabeth's services and went on a quest for additional knowledge in the deeper realms of the occult and supernatural. That's where Yates argues these trips that John D. took into the continent, the European continent, specifically him and Edward Kelly's trip to the court of Rudolf II, his moving through these towns in Europe, moving through Germany, uh, sort of, I don't want to say, it, it vitalized these occult yearnings. The, the, again, this mixture of all these different ideas, hermeticism, alchemy, science, all this different stuff. He aligned himself with several individuals who may have been charlatans, traveled through Europe, and was accused of spying for the English crown. 007, that's where we get all that stuff, writing, uh, again, secret letters back to Queen Elizabeth. Upon his return to England, he found his home and library vandalized. He eventually returned to the Queen's service, but at, was turned away when she was succeeded by James I. He died in poverty in London, and his gravesite is unknown. This is huge. Great. Again, James I... James I, he was, again, King of Scotland, James VI, but then King of England and Ireland was James I. He was against all this occult stuff. Remember, John D was, he was promoted, he was given money, he was supported by the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth never married. Queen Elizabeth never had children. Therefore, her throne was, it, it wasn't continued on. Eventually, it was given to James here. His daughter is Elizabeth Stewart. That is James the first daughter who marries Frederick the Elector 
in this magnificent, magnificent wedding in, in London, in Europe, and I mean, in England. And this is what Francis Yates and I also agree is the basis for the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. It's actually describing in symbolic terms the actual wedding of Frederick the Elector and Elizabeth Stuart because they were heralded to be the Bohemian Protestant Hermetic King and Queen. They were going to, again, this was a huge deal. We, we can't freaking understand how important this was to them. Okay. Where am I at? Okay, John D. And so James right here, he was not a favor of John D. So imagine John D. argued, again, believed by many to be the most learned man in Europe had the largest library in England. He comes back to England after all these occult travels, writing these secret letters who, to Queen Elizabeth. He gets back to find out she dies. Uh, James I becomes king, and he doesn't like him. He basically uh, banishes him. And again, like you said, he, lives, he died in poverty in London, and his gravesite is unknown. And yet he was one of the most important people in all of Europe during his life, during Queen Elizabeth. Um, eventually his later life, again, here's Edward Kelly. Now, Edward Kelly was claimed to have no ears. Uh, why is that important? Because a man with no ears was believed to have been a charlatan and Edward Kelly, according to stories, uh, this is the seal of God. This is the shoe stone as they called it. Uh, or no, this was, this was not, this was the knocking. Where's the shoe stone? Let's see here. Um, so this is, so. John D. wrote a work called the Monus Hieroglyphica, which was a very important work that influenced the, the Rosicrucians. The, the Hieroglyphica, the Monad, uh, the Elizabethan Magus and Court Astrologer of Elizabeth I of England, published in Antwerp in 1564, is an exposition of the meaning of the esoteric symbol that he invented. This is G's glyph, the Monad. And so he breaks down what this means in multiple ways, and, it, and it's you know, significance and he has stories and all this different stuff, which many people like uh, Francis Yates claims that's the sort of symbolic narrative of Christian Rosenkreutz was inspired by these Monus Hieroglyphica. Okay. So D meets Edward Kelly, apparently according to legend, um, a black stone called the shoe stone. Let me pull it up. The shoe stone. It's still in the British museum, by the way. Uh, uh, let's see. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, shoe stone, John D. Okay. Let's see. Uh, there we go. Here it is. So this is the shoe stone. You see that black obsidian stone? Um, it's basically just total black, right? Uh, let's see if we got another one. Here's a bit of a better picture. This is in the British Museum. This stone, according to legend, fell from the sky and landed in John Dee's garden. And he believed it to have been the philosopher's stone. Now, accordingly, I'm not sure, again, how quickly or what the time frame was, but this guy, Edward Kelly, came to John Dee and claimed that uh, he could read, he could contact these angels, right? And, and John D was wanting to perform this sort of series of magic conjurations. Cause again, he was inspired by all this Kabbalistic stuff that he could contact the angels for knowledge. Okay. And so him and Edward Kelly began to do these sort of seances and rituals, which, uh, yeah, the scrying stone of John D, um, he could basically, Look into the stone. Edward Kelly, again, his ears were cut off. So he was already condemned to be a charlatan, which was a way in which people, then wherever town you went in in Europe, if your ears were cut off, they, oh, you got caught for doing something, you know, keep your hand on your wallet, basically, when you're around this guy. Well, John D., again, the most learned man in Europe, encounters this guy, Edward Kelly, and was impressed with his abilities. Now, what, did Edward Kelly fool him? Maybe. I don't know. Was Edward Kelly possessed by a demon that a lot? Maybe, I don't know. But the story goes that Edward Kelly could go into these altered states and look into that shoe stone, that black obsidian stone, and he could contact angels. This led to John D. developing what he called the Enochian language. Enoch, 
again, the Enochian language. Let me see if I can pull this up. Enochian language. Enochian uh, is an occult constructed language said by its originers to have been received from angels recorded by private journals of John Dee and his colleague Edward Kelly in the late 16th century England. Kelly was a scryer who worked with Dee in his magical investigations. The language is integral to the practice of Enochian magic. Enochian magic. Enochian magic is a system of ceremonial magic based on the 16th century writings of John Dee and Edward Kelly, who wrote that their information, including the revealed Enochian language, was derived to them directly by various angels. These journals contain the record of these workings, the Enochian spirit, and the tables of correspondence used in Enochian magic. Dee and Kelly believe their visions gave them access to secrets contained in the Liber Legaeth. Um, when Dee and Kelly refer to the Book of Enoch, Enochian magic involves the evocation and commanding of various spirits. Now, we we would obviously consider this uh, demonic and I would certainly believe it to have been demonic, no doubt. But the story goes that they would travel around and and basically D could have full on conversations with um um with these angels, and that uh, from what I've read, Edward Kelly would recite the conversations. John D would write them down, and then they would like translate them. And they would be a full blown conversation. So was was Edward Kelly making it up? Well, if he did, he did a damn good job that he could lay out these coherent ramblings of again contact with these angels, and they would gather information, gather information, gather information. And D was convinced that this was real. That's why again we see the Anakian language and Anakian magic. He developed this whole thing, believing all this to be real, and it was tied to again his Monus Hieroglyphica, this entire work that he. Uh, developed. And so um, eventually they get to the court of Rudolf II. So they're traveling through the continent of Europe, going to different courts and, and, and showing people what they can do. Um, Rudolf was quite impressed and he asked them to basically uh, figure out how to turn lead into gold. He wanted more money. So he was, again, as we saw, Rudolf II was very much interested in these alchemical practices. He had his own laboratory and he allowed John D. and Edward Kelly to use his laboratory. He put them up in the castle in Prague there. Um, eventually, they, it wasn't working out. And John D. and Edward Kelly were traveling with their wives. Okay. When, <coughs> when they were in Prague, Edward Kelly told John D. that the angels told him that for any more information, they would have to wife swap basically. Now, John D very wealthy man, very learned, high status, had a beautiful younger wife, Edward Kelly, not so much. John D was very reluctant. He did not want to wife swap. He did not want to give Edward Kelly his wife, but his pursuit of this magical knowledge led Edward, uh, led John D to allowing this to happen. His wife refused, 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 did not want to do it. He basically allowed Edward Kelly to sleep with her against her will. Um, and um, John D., I, I believe what I've, what I've read, he said it was the biggest regret of his life that he let Edward Kelly sleep with his wife. They didn't get the knowledge. And what happened is that things started coming back blank. Ed, uh, John D. was able to go back. Uh, he was called back to the court of Elizabeth before she died. Again, as we read, he went. he goes back to England. Edward Kelly, uh, Rudolph II said, no, you're not going anywhere, bud. You're here. I want to figure out how to make lead into gold. Well, Edward Kelly knew he was a charlatan. He tried to leave uh, and flee the, the castle one night, and he slipped off the Spanish-style tiles on the roof, and he fell to his death. And that's how Edward Kelly died. So this whole movement, though, of John D. and Edward Kelly set a, an entire culture, an anticipation for this magical knowledge that gave rise to Rosicrucianism. Of course, Gio, Giordano Bruno, he was also at the court of Rudolf II. Later, it get, he gets burned when he goes back to Italy because of his uh, heretical beliefs, right? So he was a hermetic occultist, an Italian philosopher, poet, cosmologist, um, hermetic occultist. He is known for his cos cosmological theories, which conceptualized and extended to include the then novel Copernican model. He proposed that the stars were distant suns surrounded by their own planets 
and he raised the possibility that these planets might foster life of their own, a cosmological position known as cosmic pluralism. He also consisted that the universe is infinite and could have no center. Now, this was very different from another gentleman known as Tycho Brahe. Let me see Tycho Brahe. If you don't know about Tycho Brahe, you should. He was one of the most incredible astrologers or um, astronomists. And he wrote, he developed all this stuff. He was also at the court of Rudolf. And so these graphs, you've probably seen these things before. These were all developed by Tycho Brahe. How did he know the shape of the continents, right? This is something nobody really is totally sure. How the heck was he so accurate in his knowledge, right? I mean, look at the stuff that he would, he would draw, he would make. Tycho Prahe believed that the earth was affixed and actually the sun was revolving around the earth. And he believed that there was a firmament in which now he believed that the earth was round, but he believed that there were stars, the stars surrounding the earth were actually moving, but they were also fixed. So there wasn't this infinite universe. The stars were moving around like this and the planets were moving around the earth along with the sun. So you see here the sun, the planet, they're all moving around the earth. This was a different cosmological model by Taicho Brahe. Um, but if you look into some of his stuff, it's, it's really incredible. Again, he would use geometry and all this different stuff to sort of demonstrate his, his, his conception. So there's earth right in the middle. Again, everything revolves around earth. So... If you never looked into Taicho Brahe, I highly, highly, highly recommend you look into him. He's a very interesting figure, incredible stuff. Taicho Brahe, again, Danish astronomer known for his comprehensive, unprecedentedly accurate astronomical observations. He was known during his lifetime as an astronomer, astrologer, and an alchemist. He was the last major astronomer before the invention of the telescope. And that, again, that would change the, the entire model, the cosmological model. Um, but in, 19, in 1572, uh, Tycho noticed a completely new star that was brighter than any other planet, astonished by the existence of a star that ought not have been there, as he claimed. He devoted himself to, a, to the creation of ever more accurate instruments of measurements over the next 15 years. For, uh, King Frederick II granted Tycho an estate on the island of heaven um, and the money to build Uraniborg the first large observatory in Christian Europe. He later worked underground where he realized that his instruments in uh, Aranaborg were not sufficiently steady. His unprecedented research program both turned astronomy into the first modern science and also launched the scientific revolution. Um, so uh, very interesting stuff. Taicho was well-educated. He worked in to combine what he saw as the geometric, geometrical benefits of the Copernican heliocentrism with his philosophical benefits of the uh, uh, Ptolemaic system and devise the Tychonic system. So this is this is was his own system. And again, read read into this stuff if you if you guys are interested. Again, the Tychonic system shows in color that the objects that rotate around the Earth shown on the blue orbits and the objects that rotate around the sun shown in the or orange orbits. So the sun rotates around the earth and the planets rotate around the sun. And then the, the stars rotate around like that, according to his model of the universe. So check that out. If you guys aren't familiar. Um, anyways. Yeah. Somebody said you are tab maxing. I definitely am. And I do this almost all the time. I am terrible. People see my computer like, oh my gosh, how many tabs do you have open? I don't know. It's just how it's how I do things. So um, here we go. Continuing on here again, Giordano Bruno, yada, yada, you get it. Let's get to Rosicrucianism. Okay. So eventually we get to Rosicrucianism, right? All this stuff had taken place before. And Rosicrucianism, a spiritual and cultural movement that arose in Europe in the early 17th century after the publication of several texts announcing to the world a thitherto unknown esoteric order. Rosicrucianism is symbolized by the rosy cross. The rosy cross. Um, with, again, associated with Rosen, uh, uh, Christian Rosenkreutz, Christian Kabbalist. Uh, the Rose Cross is a cross with a rose in the center. 
uh, often a red or golden white, symbolize the teaching of Western esoteric tradition with Christian tenets. Okay, so the rose is the esotericism and the cross is the Christian tenets, which they believe was this, uh, again, a revolutionary happening here. Um, <clears throat> so Rosicrucianism between 1610 and 1615, two anonymous manifestos appeared in Germany and soon after were published throughout Europe. The Fama Fraternum's Hatus Rose Crucis, uh, the fame of the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross, was published at Casal in 1614, though it has been circulated in manuscript among German occultists since about 1610. Johannes Valentinus Andrahe was, has been considered the possible author of the work. Now, see, this is another thing. And I have him on here. Where is Johannes? Johannes, Johannes, Johannes. Here we go. Johannes Valen, Valentinus Andrahe uh, claimed to be the author of the ancient text known as the, the um, Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz in 1459. This became one of the three founding works of Rosicrucianism, which was both a legend and a fashionable cultural phenomenon across Europe during this period. Andrahe was a prominent member of the Protestant Utopian movement, which began in Germany and spread across Northern Europe and into Britain. Remember, England and Germany. Um, he was under the mentorship of Samuel Hartlib and uh, John Osmos Comenius. Um, and he's another one of these theologians. I have him somewhere as we move through. But like many vaguely religious Renaissance movements at the time, the scientific ideas being promoted were often tinged with hermeticism, occultism, and Neoplatonic concepts. <clears throat> the threats of heresy charges posed by rigid religious authorities, Protestant and Catholic, and a scholastic intellectual climate often forced these activities to hide behind fictional secret societies and write anonymously in support of their ideas while claiming access to secret ancient wisdom. And so by all accounts, uh, uh, Johannes Valentinus and dry was a very, very, very intelligent guy. And when asked if he wrote this stuff, well, he said he wrote it when he was a kid and he didn't believe any of it. At the same time, during his professional life, he also wrote things that basically promoted these Rosicrucian alchemical hermetic ideals. Um, a, literal, a literal reading narrates the travels and education of Father Brother CRC and his founding of a secret brotherhood similarly uh, prepared men. Names, numbers, and other details have cabalistic illusions in which the cognoscenti of the era were well-versed. The Confessio Fraternitatis published in Frankfurt in 1615, responded to confessions and criticisms and elaborated the matter further. So let me say, uh, let me summarize um, the, uh, the manifestos real quick. So the manifestos, the chemical wedding, uh, here we go. Uh, so the Fama Fraternitatis, um, Again, it tells the story of the mythic figure of Christian Rosenkreutz who travels to the Middle East, Egypt, and Morocco to learn esoteric knowledge and wisdom. Upon returning to Germany, he establishes the Fraternity of the Rose Cross, a secret society of like-minded individuals who share his interest in the occult and in bringing about a spiritual reformation of society. The text describes the principles and beliefs of the Rosicrucian order, including the idea of a universal reformation the importance of spiritual knowledge and understanding, and the need for a new approach to science and medicine. It also includes a call to action, urging readers to join the fraternity of the Rose Cross and work towards the realization of their shared goals. And that's the thing. People would read these and they would tell them, join the order, join the, you know, the brotherhood. But where exactly do they go? Where do, that's the ethereal nature of it. That's the sort of mystical nature of it. There, there really isn't a place to go. Now, the Confessio, the one written the next year, the Confessio Fraternitatis is one of the three Rosicrucian manifestos. It's the second one. And it follows the story of the founding of the fraternity by Christian Rosenkreutz. But this text begins with a statement for the need of a spiritual reform in society and the descriptions of the principles of the order. It, it basically further elaborates on the Fama, including the importance of inner spiritual development, the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom, and the use of natural remedies for healing. It goes on to describe the structure of the Rosicrucian order and the roles of its members, including the use of allegory and symbolism in their teaching and practices and the meditation of contemplation. 
The Confessio Fraternitatis also includes a critique of contemporary society and culture, particularly the corrupt and oppressive institutions of the Catholic Church and the state. The text ends with a call to action. Again, become part of the brotherhood. Be join the Rosicrucian brotherhood. But again, like if somebody's reading this, like, well, where do I go? There is no place. That's because it's part of this sort of pursuit of this esoteric spiritual knowledge that as you acquire the knowledge, basically the Rosicrucian brothers will find you, meaning you'll really be able to decipher the symbolism better. The chemical wedding is... Um, a complex allegorical tale that recounts the journey of Christian Krosenkoitz to a mysterious castle where he is invited to witness a royal wedding. Again, as Francis Yates highlights, and I believe it's the wedding of Frederick the Elector with, um, uh, um, with uh, Emily Stewart. Um, the, throughout the story, Rosenkreutz encounters a series of mystical and alchemical rituals, symbolic representations of spiritual purification and transformation. He also encounters a range of characters who represent different aspects of human nature and the journey towards spiritual enlightenment. The chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz is a full symbolism of esoteric references, making it difficult to interpret its meaning. However, it's generally understood as a symbolic representation. Okay. So... Um, okay. Many were attracted through the promise of a universal reformation of mankind through a science built on esoteric truths in the ancient past, which concealed from the average man and provided insight into the na into nature, the physical universe, and the spiritual realm, which they said had been kept secret for decades until the intellectual climate might receive it. The manifestos elaborate these matters extensively, but cryptically in terms of Kabbalah, Hermeticism, alchemy, and Christian mysticism, subjects whose methods, symbolism, and illusions were ardently studied by many intellectuals of the period. In 1617, a... Oh, yeah, we've already... Okay, the chemical wedding um, with its fertile brood of monsters, the Ludibrimium, which was... Uh, okay, anyways... Da, 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 da. The promise of a spiritual transformation at a time of great turmoil, the manifestos influenced many figures to seek esoteric knowledge. 17th century occult philosophers such as Michael Meyer, Robert Flood, Thomas Vaughan, here's another one, um, interested themselves in the Rosicrucian worldview in his work, uh, Salentium Post Calamoris. Meyer described Rosicrucianism as having arisen from the primordial tradition. You see, Prisca Theologia. Remember when we talked about Prisca Theologia? Um, saying that our origins are Egyptian, Brahmanic, derived from the mysteries of Eleusis, uh, Samothrace, the Magi of Persia, the Pythagoreans, and the Arabs. In later centuries, many esoteric societies have claimed to derive the original Rosicrucians. The most influential of these societies has been the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which derived from Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia and counted many prominent figures among its members. The largest of the Rosicrucian Order of Am, uh, Americ, A-M-O-R-C, a multinational organization based in San Jose, California. Paul Foster Case, founder of the Builders of Adiatum, as a successor to the Golden Dawn. Okay, got it. Again, we're not going to go into all this, um, all that stuff. Here's the, again, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Um. So the peak of the Rosicrucianism uh, four was reached when two mysterious posters appeared on the walls in Paris in, in 1622. So again, between 1614 and 22, about 400 manuscripts and books were published with discussed the Rosicrucian documents. Uh, then you had the Rosicrucian scare in Paris, um, which again, um, Francis Yates talks about again. I I plan on even talking, reading some of this stuff from Francis Yates, but it's too much information. Like, I feel like I've already overwhelmed you guys already, and uh, and so, anyways, we'll we'll continue on here, guys. Smash that like if you can. Um, would greatly appreciate it. Now get to all the super chats here in a few. Um, we're gonna wrap up some of this stuff. I know we're already hitting on two hours. Uh. Do make our stay visibly and invisibly in the city and the second ended with the worlds of thoughts attached to the real desire of the seeker. The legendary first manifesto in Elijah Asmol's uh, Theatrium Chemicum Britannicum, he defends the Rosicrucians. Some later works impacting Rosicrucians were the Opus Magno Cabalisticum uh, et Theosophicum of George von Welling, 
of alchemical and Paracelsian inspiration. Michael Meyer was appointed the Count Palatine of, by Rudolf II and the King of Hungary. He was also one of the most prominent defenders of the Rosicrucianisms, Rosicrucians, clearly transmitting details about the Brothers of the Rose Cross in his writings. Meyer made the firm statement that the Brothers of R.C. exist to advance inspired arts and sciences, including alchemy. Let me check something real quick. Okay. Um, Meyer made a firm statement that the brothers of RC exist in advance inspired arts and sciences, including alchemy. Researchers of Meyer's writings point that he never claimed to have produced gold, nor did Heinrich Kuhnrunth. Heinrich Kuhnrunth is another guy through here where we'll come across. As any of the other Rosicrucians, their writings point toward a symbolic and spiritual alchemy rather than an operative one. In a combination of direct and veiled styles, these writings convey the nine stages of the involutive, evolutive transmutation of the threefold body of the human being, the threefold soul, and the threefold spirit among the esoteric knowledge related to the path of initiation. Okay. Some modern scholars, for example, Adam McLean and Giordano Berti, assume that among the first followers of the Rose Cross, there was also the German theologian Daniel Kramer, who in 1617 published a bizarre treatise entitled The Societus Jesus et Rose Crucis Vera, The True Society of Jesus and the Rosy Cross, containing 40 emblematic emblems accompanied by biblical quotations. The idea of such an order exemplified by the network of astronomers, professors, mathematicians, and natural philosophers in the 16th century Europe, promoted by such men as Johannes Kepler, George Joachim Redicus, uh, John Dee, and Tycho Brahe, gave rise to the Invisible College. This was the precursor to the Royal Society, founded in 1660. It was constituted by a group of scientists who began to hold regular meetings to share and develop knowledge acquired by experimental investigation. Among these were Robert Boyle, who founded the Royal Society and wrote, The cornerstones of the invisible, or as they term themselves, the Philosophical College, do now and then honor me with their company. John Wilkins and John Wallace, who described those meetings in the following terms, about the year 1645, while I lived in young London, at a time when our civil wars, uh, academical studies, were much in uh, interrupted in both our universities, I had the opportunity of being acquainted with a diverse, worthy persons, inquisitive natural philosophy, and other parts of human learning, and particularly of what hath been called a new philosophy or experimental philosophy. We did, by agreements, uh, divers us meet weekly in London on a certain day and hour until a certain penalty and a weekly contribution for the change of experiments which certain rules agreed amongst and treat the discourse of such affairs. Okay. So Thomas Vaughan was another uh, important, a Welsh clergyman, philosopher, alchemist who wrote in English. He is now remembered for his work in the field of natural magic. He also published under the pseudonym uh, Eugenius Philalethes. Uh, his influences included Johannes Trithemius, uh, Cornelius Agrippa, uh, Michael Synovogius, and Rosicrucian. Now, Johannes Trithemius was the first one to actually write in code which is kind of an interesting thing, uh, was a Benedictine abbot and polymath, was active, a chronicler and cryptographer, right? He's one of, considered one of the first cryptographers. Is, is he? He's considered the, the founder of modern cryptography, a claim shared by Leon Bastista Alberti and steganography, as well as the founder of bibliography and literary studies as branches of knowledge. He has considerable influence on the development of early modern and modern occultism. His students included Henry Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus. Okay, moving on. Again, we read a little bit about the Fama, the Chemical, the Confessio. Okay, the Order of the Garter is quite interesting because um, James, as we talked about, James was not uh, not that interested in helping Elizabeth and her husband, Frederick the Elector. and But he had initiated Frederick the Elector into the Order of the Garter, in the Order of the Garter. And so this was a order of chivalry founded by Edward III of England in 1348. 
as its most senior order of knighthood in the British honor systems, outranked by precedence only by the Victoria Cross and the George Cross. The Order of the Garter is dedicated to the image and the arms of St. George. Here's Heidelberg Castle, where Frederick the Elector and uh, Elizabeth Stuart lived, which I will be visiting on my trip to Germany. I cannot wait to go visit. Uh, this was a magnificent work of art uh, during its time. It's a ruin in Germany, landmark Heidelberg. Uh, the castle ruins are among the most important Renaissance structures north of the Alps. The castle has only been partially rebuilt since its demolition in the 17th, 18th century. It is located 800 meters uh, of the northern part of, I don't know. Anyways, moving on here. Um, the Christian, a uh, prince of Anault, he was the right-hand man of Frederick the Elector, remember? Um, Francis Bacon. Was Francis Bacon a Rosicrucian? Well, if we roll down here. Cult theories. Francis Bacon often gathered with the men in the Gray's Inn to discuss politics and philosophy and to try out various theatrical scenes of admitting uh, admitted writing. Now, you guys know Francis Bacon was a empiricist, right? Uh, English philosopher, statesman, served as attorney general. Bacon led the advancement of natural philosophy and the scientific method, right? Scientific revolution. He's been the father, called the father of empiricism. But at the same time, as Francis Yates argues, he was also part of the Rosicrucian. See, uh, however, others, including Daphne de Muir in her biography of Bacon, have argued that there is no substantive evidence to support claims of the involvement of the Rosicrucians. Francis Yates does not make the claim that Bacon was a Rosicrucian, but presents evidence that he was nevertheless involved in some of the more closed intellectual movements of his day. She argues that Bacon's movement for the advancement of learning was closely connected with the German, German Rosicrucian movement, while Bacon's New Atlantis, remember I showed this, Bacon's New Atlantis portrays a land ruled by Rosicrucians. He apparently saw his own movement for the advancement of learning to be in conformity with the Rosicrucian ideals. The link between Bacon's work and Rosicrucian ideals, which Yates allegedly found, was the conformity of the purposes expressed by the Rosicrucian manifestos and Bacon's plan for a great um, instauration. Uh, for the two were calling for the formation of both divine and human understanding, as well as both he had in view the purpose of mankind's return to the state before the fall. Okay. So we see, uh, and, and she has a whole chapter in this book on uh, Bacon and his relationship. I certainly do think he was influenced and that he was quite aware of it. Uh, another person, Tom, uh, Tommaso Campanella. This is where we start getting into Italy. So he was a baptized Italian Dominican friar, philosopher, theologian, astrologer, and poet. He was imprisoned for magic. Let's see, uh, Campanella was persecuted by the Roman Inquisition for heresy in 1594. It was confined to house arrest um, for two years, accused of conspiring against the Spanish rulers of Calabria. In 1599, he was tortured and sent to prison where he spent 27 years. Now, he wrote The City of the Sun, a utopia describing an egalitarian the theocratic society where property is held in common. Now, uh, let's see here. Um, See, Campanella was eventually let out. Here we go. <coughs> Campanella was finally released from prison in 1626, right, right in our ballpark, through Pope Urban, who personally interceded on his behalf with Philip of Spain, taken to Rome or held for a time by the Holy Office. Campanella was restored to full liberty in 1629 as Urban badly needed Campanella's magical skills to protect him from the dangers of two upcoming eclipses. The Pope's enemies thought that they could take advantage of his credulity, and they confidently predicted that the eclipses in 1628 and 1630 surely heralded the Pope's demise. So there's a book called Demotic Magic from Ficino to Campanella, which I would highly recommend. I should have grabbed that. That's over on my shelf over there. It's also really interesting and highlights a lot of this stuff. Again, demonic magic. And it has to do with conjuring and getting demons or getting names. Again, it's tied to Kabbalah. Um, that's what Kabbalah is all about. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
Next one, Elias Ashmole, uh, also a notable Rosicrucian uh, and member of the Royal Society, was an English antiquary, politician, officer of arms, astrologer, and a student of alchemy. Ashmole supported the Royalist side during the English Civil War and the restoration of Charles II. He was rewarded with several lucrative offices. Ashmole um, was an antiquary with a strong Baconian, again, Francis Bacon, leaning towards the study of nature, his library reflected his intellectual outlook, including works on English history, law, um, numismatics, choreography, alchemy, astrology, astronomy, and botany. Although he was, uh, although he was one of the founding fellows of the Royal Society, key institution, experimental sciences, he was an early Freemason. Um, let's see here, command find. Uh, Rosa crew. There we go. So Ashmole circles was contemptuous of nonconformity though. Ashmole was one of the earliest Freemasons and appears in his writings to have been a zealous Rosicrucian. Uh, John Gadbury wrote that Anthony Wood hath falsely called him a Rosicrucian, whereas no man was further from fostering such follies. Ashmole involvement with Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism may have been the social of the interest of the antiquarian. Okay. Universal knowledge is described in Rosicrucian writings is the idea have may have partly inspired Ashmole's I desire to found a great museum. This was another main figure. John Amos Comenius um, was a Moravian philosopher, pedagogue and theologian who was considered the father of modern education. Um, Let's see. Comenius introduced a number of educational concepts and innovations, including pictorial textbooks written in native languages instead of Latin teaching based in gradual development from simple to more comprehensive. Let me see. Command find. There we go. Um, in 1612, he read the Rosicrucian Manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis. Comenius was greatly influenced by the Irish Jesuit William Baith, as well as his teachers, Johann. Piscator and yeah, okay, I don't know. I don't know those people. Okay. The invisible college. Now this is a important, again, important part of Rosicrucianism is the term used for a small community of interacting scholars who are often met face to face to exchange ideas and encourage each other. One group has been described as the precursor group to the Royal Society of London considered consisted of a number of natural philosophers around Robert Boyle, such as Christopher Wren. It has been suggested that other members, including prominent figures, concur with the Royal Society. But the concept of the Invisible College is mentioned in German Rosicrucian pamphlets in the early 17th century. Ben Johnson in England referenced the idea related to the meaning to Francis Bacon's House of Solomon, a mask, the fortunate isles of their union from 1624 to 5, the term accrued currency for the exchanges of correspondence with the Republic letters. Um, yeah. And so let's see here. Yeah. So emblematic image of the Rosicrucian College here. This is one of the famous engravings. Um, so we can see the, uh, we see Fama right there, the Fama Fraternitatis, the Collegium Fraternitatis, so the fraternity, the college fraternity. Uh, and this, this, the whole thing is replete with mystical symbolism. Okay. And so if you're initiated, you're going to understand this. So you see Jehovah up here, right, in Hebrew. You see these weird, you know, what, what's a goose doing over here? A man wrapped with like a serpent with a chicken head, um, uh, and a random arm sticking out, the trumpet call. The fama starts with a trumpet call. So most Rosicrucian arts, you're going to see a sort of trumpet symbolism somewhere. And so here we go right there. So this is indicative of the in, what they call the invisible college. This is the because again, Rosicrucianism is a theory. It's a th it's ethereal. You can't put your finger on it, right? They didn't have these specific orders you go to like you have now, and so nobody knew who is a Rosicrucian, who isn't. And as I told you, people believe that Rosicrucians, um, like they were invisible, and that they could go from invisible to visible. And you know, this is how Descartes proved he wasn't a Rosicrucian because people could see him. I kid you not. Robert Flood, very interesting gentleman, very interesting, was, in, was a prominent English Paracelsian physician with both scientific and occult 
interests. He is remembered as an astrologer, mathematician, cosmologist, Kabbalist, and Rosicrucian. Flood is best described for his compilation of his occult philosophy, a celebrated exchange with views of Johannes Kepler concerning scientific and hermetic approaches to knowledge. Um, so his big thing was the macro microcosm relationship, which is obviously going to be um, a a uh, hermetic understanding. He also was in favor of the Trinity because he privileged the idea of Trinitarian division. Um, see, here he goes. The Trinitarian division is important in that it reflects the mystical framework for biology. Flood was heavily reliant on scripture. In the Bible, the number three represented princip princ principium formarium uh, or other or the original form. Uh, it was the number, furthermore, is the number of the Holy Trinity. Thus, the number three formed the perfect body paralleling the Trinity. This allowed man and earth to approach the infinity of God and created universally and sympathy. So let's go here. Let's put uh, Robert Flood engraving. So let's see. This was one of his. So you see, these are really intricate artworks um, that are engraved. Now, again, imagine, I don't know if you guys know how engraving works. Here's Robert's, here's a, a work by Robert Flood. So you see the harmony, right? So he, he's got the numbers, he's got the, the instruments, he's got numbers, letters, castles, architecture, sound. What he's demonstrating is the macro microcosm. Um, and how all this uh, harmony is the secret order. Harmony is the secret order. So, um, here's another famous work of his. <laughs> Mundus Sens Sensibilis, uh, the so this looks like this is the, the the tripartite process of vision, of corporate vision. So these are some of the engravings that Robert Flood was noted for. Let's see if we can find some more here. So teaching the young man, comprehensive. So anyways, these are some of the engravings. Uh, we don't need to keep going into this too much more. But here's a Robert Flood as above, so below. Um, here's one in color. Uh, ah, man. I wish you could see that. Here's a famous one. This is the man as the might of the macrocosm. This is also from Robert Flood. So what they're doing is they're symbolically explaining the spiritual knowledge and philosophy of Rosicrucianism through these artworks. But at the same time, they would never claim that they are quote unquote Rosicrucian because that's the whole point of its ethereal network is that you have to know the knowledge. You have to be spiritually illuminated. You have to develop that, in that inner flame, right? They cultivate that inner flame so that they can recognize more and more and more. And so Robert Flood and Michael Meyer, they made all these engravings and wrote these books and wrote these pamphlets. And what they're doing is they're writing things for people. If you have basically, if you have eyes to see, then you'll understand what it is. If you don't, then you're not going to understand it. And so we always see Jehovah up here in the cloud you see his hand coming down that god's hand is tied to the hand of man you see this that's what they're symbolizing and then they're then they're using like taicho brahe and and different understandings of cosmology to explain everything um so this when you when you hear like engravings that's what they're talking about they're talking about this stuff here's an in color one of michael meyer so Anyways, it goes on and on and on. It's pretty interesting stuff if you find that stuff interesting. I do, but um, okay. So that's Robert Flood. 
Um, again, he was very much interested in the macro and the micro. Here's Flood's illustration of the man, the microcosm with the new, again, we just showed you this. Um, so you can see how it all fits. You can, you can understand the Vitruvian man and all this different stuff at this point. Defense of Rosicrucianism. Flood was not a member of the Rosicrucians and often alleged, but he defended their thoughts and expressed in numerous manifestos and pamphlets. He produced a quick work. See how all these people that Francis Yates, again, goes through and highlights that the Rosicrucians, all these guys always say they're not. That's part of the MO of the Rosicrucians is that back in this time, nobody would explicitly say, oh, I'm Rosicrucian. No, that's the point. The Rosicrucian, the, the, the invisible college, the invisible brotherhood is the invisible connection between people who had this sort of alchemical, Kabbalistic and hermetic knowledge. So, um, you know, he produced a quick work against uh, claims of Libavius, who I had up there, um, that the Rosicrucians indulged in heresy, diabolical magic and sedition made in his analysis, confessios for Taunus, for Tata, for <laughs> fraternitatis de rose cruce in 1615 flood returned to the subject matter in great at length um it is now seriously doubted that any formal organization identifiable identifiable as the brothers of the rose cross ever actually existed in any extent form again as i've been highlighting the theological and philosophical claims circulating under this name appear to these outsiders to have been more in intellectual fashion that swept europe at the time of the counter-reformation these thinkers suppose that in claiming to be part of the secret cult scholars of alchemy the occult and hermetic mysticism merely sought the additional prestige by being able to promote their views while claiming exclusive adherence to some revolutionary pan-european secret society by this logic some suppose that the society itself never have actually existed which has been my claim I don't think that it ever actually existed there wasn't actually a secret society that you could put your finger on and say look here it is uh, between 1607 and 1616, two uh, anonymous Rosicrucian manifestos. We already learned about that. Yada, yada, yada. It is claimed that the work of uh, Comenius and Hartlib on early education in England were strongly influenced by Rosicrucian ideas. You see, Rosicrucianism, like I said, is more of a set of beliefs. It's a, it's a worldview. It's a paradigm. It's a perception. It's not a, it's not a thing you can go touch, really. Rosicrucian literature became the sandbox of theosophists and charlatans who claimed to be connected to the mysterious brotherhood. Robert Flood led the battle. It is said that sometimes that he was the great English mystical philosopher of the 17th century, a man of immense erudition, of exalted mind, and to judge by his writings of extreme personal sanctity. It is also said that Flood did was liberate occultism, both from the uh, uh, traditional Aristotelian philosophy and from the coming Cartesian philosophy of his time. Okay, so he was against Kepler. So uh, Johannes Kepler criticized Flood's theories of the cosmic harmony. Again, so again, harmony is the whole basis of this macro-micro thing that these Hermeticists and uh, Rosicrucians were interested in. So here's an astrologer casting a horoscope. This is uh, created by Robert Flood. This is an engraving. Okay, so you get it. You get it. Here's Michael Meyer, the other famous uh, Rosicrucian that was tied, you know, in engra another engraver who uh, who spread a lot of these ideas. Michael Meyer, the real Michael Meyer, was a German physician and counselor to Rudolf II of Habsburg. He was a learned alchemist, epigrammist, and amateur composer. Meyer was born in Riedensburg, Holstein, the son of a specialist. Um, yada, yada, yada. Let's see here. Command fine. There we go. So a devout Lutheran all his life, Michael Meyer had a strong influence on Sir Isaac Newton. He was also involved in the Rosicrucian movement that appeared around this, this time, which afforded part of the matter of this Themis Aurora. Um Okay. Ashmole said that they began to learn seal engraving, casting in sand, and goldsmith's work when living in Black's Fairs, London, at which time he was initiated into Rosicrucian secrets by William Backhouse of Swallowfield in Berkshire. While illustrating the chain of the Rosy Cross, 
links from Michael Meyer and Robert Flood via Backhouse to Ashmole. The details given about Ashmole's training as a craftsman could illustrate the background of the later conception. Yeah. So, um, so if we go to Michael Meyer engraving. Find stuff like this. Michael Meyer. And so Atlanta Fugians. So this is a, so this one, like right here, this is a big one because this is all symbolic. This is part of the Rosicrucianism. So this woman represents nature. This man has glasses on, right? He's looking for his way. He has a stick. He has a light. He's trying to find his way in the world. And he's following the footsteps of nature. This is indicative of the naturalistic theology and philosophy of Rosicrucianism. You see, it's not a thing that you touch. It's a set of beliefs and worldview. And Michael Meyer and through the Atlantean Fugians, Atlanta Fug, let me see if I have that. There it is. Atlanta Fugians is an emblem book with the alchemical theme by Michael Meyer, published by Johann Theodore de Bry in Oppenheim. See, Theodore de Bry, this guy right here, he published all this stuff. The, the whole Rosicrucian movement couldn't have got going without Theodore de Bry publishing it in Oppenheim. He was a sympathetic publisher. And that's, again, this all happened in Germany because Germany had the ability to publish books. He was an engraver and publisher, born in Strasbourg. Um, let me see if there's anything on. So she also points out the important role in publishing works such as for Flood and Meyer in defense of the fraternity of Rosicrucians. After the capture of Oppenheim in 1620, Debray moved the printing house back to Frankfurt. See, all this stuff was printed by, Opp uh, by Debray in Oppenheim. And Oppenheim was a city in Germany that basically allowed all this magical worldview and practices to thrive. Here's Francis Drake. This is an engraving. Again, his travels to the New World. Um, here's Pocahontas. This is an engraving that Debray published. The Abduction of Pocahontas in 1624 by George Keller. So, Johann Theodore de Bry, incredibly important word or man in Rosicrucianism in regards to printing everything. Printing everything. Uh, many of his works were printed by de Bry, also featured engravings by, again, his son in law, Matthias Marion. Uh, which dedicate and celebrates the elector Palatine Frederick V, Oppenheim's ruler. Historian Francis Yates suggests that Debray Publishing House had close ties to the elector's court at Heidelberg, given that it printed works by supporters by Frederick in the short-lived attempt to have him installed as the King of Bohemia. Okay. Um, now, here's uh, Rene Descartes. And if we go... Uh, the membership of Descartes uh, to the Rosicrucians is debated. The initials of his name have been linked to RC, uh, acronym used widely by Rosicrucians. Furthermore, in 1619, uh, Descartes moved to Ulm, uh, Ulm, which was a well-renowned international center for the Rosicrucian movement. During his journey in Germany, he met Johannes uh, Folber, who had previously expressed his personal commitment to join the Brotherhood. Now, again, Descartes, was accused of being a Rosicrucian. He denied it. And when he went back to Paris from Germany, he said, look, I'm not a Rosicrucian. You can see me because one of the claims, as I said, was that the Rosicrucians were invisible. Um, <clears throat> now, like I said, he actually dedicates uh, the ending of his, his book uh, to the Queen of Bohemia, which was Elizabeth Stewart. Elizabeth Stewart, remember, the wife of Frederick the Elector Palatine. Uh, yeah. So anyways, um, we already talked about Francis Bacon, I believe. Yeah. We already talked about Francis Bacon, uh, Anglican church order of the temple of the Rosy cross. This is the 20th century version. I'm not going to get into all this stuff. This is a theosophical group. It was founded in 1912. 
again, including Annie Besant. This is a whole mixture now of, of theosophy and, and perennialism. This is different. This is not the exact same thing as the Rosicrucian enlightenment of the development of the Rosicrucian mysticism of this, of this general order. Okay. Here's another modern was an American, uh, Ruben Swinborn climber. He claimed to have been the master of the Fraternitatis Rose Crucis, perhaps the oldest continuing Rosicrucian organization in America. And he published works by the teachings of Pascal Beverly Randolph. Remember, he was all about alchemy, nutrition, religion, sex, magic, and spiritualism. Uh, we don't need to worry about him. Francis Yates, who wrote this book. She was a Renaissance scholar. That's all you need to know. Uh, Atlantis Fugans, Fugians. Philip Sidney was an also another uh, purported potential member of the Rosicrucians. He was a great poet, English poet, if you're not aware you probably heard of Sir Philip Sidney. Uh, Sir Philip Sidney was an English poet, courtier, scholar, and soldier who is remembered as one of the most prominent figures of the Elizabethan age. Han Gruder, or Hannes Gruder, um, was a Flemish-born philologist, scholar, and librarian. He was the librarian of the Heidelberg Library that, again, had all these works in it that got burned down when the Catholics uh, won the Battle of White Mountain and took over that part of Southern Germany and smashed the Protestant hermetic uh, reformation, if you will, their response against, um, against all this stuff. So uh, that is that. Um, and then we had Taicho Brahe, which I highly recommend looking in the Taichonic system. Uh, Robert Boyle, founder of the Royal Society. And so, guys, I think that's going to pr pretty much do it. So for those of you, again, we, we covered so much. What is Rosicrucianism? Rosicrucianism is a set of ideas. It is a syncretic worldview that is building upon the Italian, uh, German, and English Renaissance and the Scientific Revolution. All four of these movements, plus Hermeticism, plus Jewish Kabbalah, plus alchemy, plus Neoplatonism, all these things come together to form this worldview called Rosicrucianism, which got developed in 1614, 1615, and 1616 through three different manifestos, the Fama Fraternitatis, the Confessio Fraternitatis, and the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, none of which I believe actually existed. I do not believe Christian Rosenkreutz existed. I do not believe that there is actually a, a Rosicrucian order that you could go and everybody was meeting and you could touch. It was a secret society. It was an ethereal thing. It was for the people in the know, but they would make proclamations publicly about the order and what they were doing and what they believed. Um. It had a metaphysic that was a, that was based on the Neoplatonic monad that got popularized through human uh, the the Renaissance humanism such as Marsilio Ficino. Um, it had a what I called a mystical rational epistemology. What was the epistemology of Rosicrucianism? Well, it was a mystical rationalism because this is this is again after the scientific revolution, but before the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment always remember the Enlightenment pulls the superstition out of rationalism. So therefore it's just pure rationalism without superstition. Well, before the enlightenment, again, that's why we call it the Rosicrucian enlightenment is that it was spiritual, superstitious, mystical, and rational alchemy, uh, astrology. These things weren't just, uh, empirical things. They were also spiritual things. And this stuff went together. That was part of the enlightenment. That was part of this new understanding of natural philosophy and theology that we could acquire true gnosis, true spiritual knowledge through empirical studies of, of nature in the world. That's kind of the basis of this thing. And so um, it had what I called a mystical rationalism where, not, where knowledge was both spiritual and empirical, which could be gained by natural observation and experiment. Now its ethic was purely Protestant. Rosicrucianism is through and through a Protestant movement. It's built on Protestantism. Without the Protestant Reformation, there would be no Rosicrucianism. 
Rosicrucianism is Protestantism mixed with all this magic, Kabbalah, and mysticism, Hermeticism, mixing it together and saying, look, this is the new worldview. This is what's going to revolutionize the world. This is what's going to create a utopia. And this utopian, this utopian anticipation is really the basis um, for Rosicrucianism. Now, let me see if, let me see something real quick. There's so much in here. Um, yeah, let me let me read you the end of the Yates, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Okay, I mean this is the last page and a half. I'll read it to you guys. Send in super chats if you want. I'm going to get to all those in just a moment. I'm going to get to all the super chats in just a moment. I promise. Um, but uh, just to conclude our stream on Rosicrucianism, I'm going to read again the last few pages of. D Francis Yates, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Again, Neoplatonic monad, metaphysic, uh, mystical rationalism, a, a Protestant ethic, uh, an anthropology which believed man had a divine spark tied to that Neoplatonic monad, and that you develop that, that divine spark through alchemy, Kabbalah, and Hermeticism, magic. And then biblical hermeneutics, it interpreted, it interpreted scripture symbolically and mystically. It did not interpret scripture as purely literal. That was part of this Rosicrucian movement. Although, um, in ways, they did view it literal. It's just they had, a, again, sola scriptura. They could have their own interpretation. So how it ends. Francis Yates says, the most striking aspect of the Rosicrucian movement is the one which the title of this book gives expression. It's insistence on a coming enlightenment. The world nearing its end is to receive a new illumination in which the advances in knowledge made in the preceding age of the Renaissance will be immensely expanded. New discoveries are at hand. A new age is dawning. And this illumination shines inward as well as outward. In its inward spiritual illumination, revealing to man new possibilities in himself, teaching him to understand his own dignity and worth and part he is called upon to play in the divine scheme. We have seen that the Rosicrucian Enlightenment did in fact shed rays on the 17th century advance, and that many bearers of na names famous in that advance seem to have been aware of it. It is hoped that this will demonstrate finally what indeed has already been revealed by many that the hermetic Kabbalist tradition as a force in the background of Renaissance science did not lose that force with the coming of the scientific revolution, that it was still present in the background of the minds of figures formerly taken as fully representative of the complete emergence from such influences. What exactly was the part played by Rosicrucian science and more particularly by Rosicrucian mathematics in the great advance? These are questions which this book has not attempted to answer. The Rosicrucian Enlightenment included a vision of the necessity for a reform of society, particularly of education, for a third reformation of religion, embracing all sides of man's activity, and saw this as a necessary accompaniment of the new science. Rosicrucian thinkers were aware of the dangers of the new science, of its diabolical as well as its angelical possibilities, and they saw that its arrival would be accompanied by a general reformation of the whole entire world. This side of the message was perhaps best understood in parliamentary England through circumstances prevented its application, and after the restoration, science was allowed to develop in isolation from utopia and apart from the idea of a reformed society educated to receive it. The comparative disregard for a social and educational possibilities of the movement was surely unfortunate for the future. Thus, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment was indeed, I suggest, an enlightenment, putting forward within its own strange frame of reference of magical and angelic agencies, of prophecy and apocalypse, a movement most of the aspects of which can only be described as enlightened. Though the Enlightenment proper seems to induce a very different atmosphere, yet its rationalism was tinged with Illuminism. The words of Comenius and Lalusius, which has been called the Comenian Fama, might serve a text for both the Enlightenments. And this is how she ends it. If a light of universal wisdom can be enkindled, it will be both 
to spread the beams throughout the whole world of the human intellect, just as the radiance of the sun, as often as it rises, reaches from the east to the west, and to awake gladdens in the hearts of men, and to transform their wills. If they see their own destiny and that of the world clearly set before them in the supreme light and learn how to use the means which will unfailingly lead to good ends, why should they not actually use them? And so, again, Rosicrucianism is a set of mystical, spiritual beliefs that is entwined with the scientific revolution, entwined with the German, English, and Italian Renaissance during that period, right before the Thirty Years' War, right before the Catholic Church trying to stamp these ideas out. It did not stamp them out. They went underground. However, eventually this Rosicrucian Enlightenment led just into the Enlightenment. And this rationalism, what I call this mystical rationalism, eventually it went away. And what came in, in its place was just rationalism, no longer mysticism. So um, that is going to uh, do it for tonight's stream. Thank you so much to Meta Ninjas for sponsoring this stream. It's so much information. I don't even know how well it came across. I feel like I could have done a lot better job than I did. So I apologize if I was all over the place. It felt like a ton of information to express. Um, but, uh, yes, thank you guys. Thank you to Meta Ninjas. I hope this now can put a, um, a definitive mark on what is Rosicrucianism and, um, yeah. So thank you guys very, very much. And I'll get into some super chats. God bless you all. I truly, truly do appreciate it. Uh, let's see. First super chat comes from AC. Well, he became a new member tonight along with many people along with many people. Also, shout out to Pottery in Central Washington for your $20 Super Chat. Thank you so much, Pottery in Washington. Throws in $20 Super Chat. Uh, and it was a sticker that said, uh, you're amazing. Well, thank you so much, Pottery in Central Washington. You're amazing, brother. God bless you, bro. Thank you so much. Um, and then uh, next one was uh, Giub throws in $20. Have you read Philosophy and Theurgy in Late Antiquity by August Uzavinis? If not, you should. I tried reading it, but it was too difficult for me to understand. You may get some value, valuable critiques and insights from it. I'll look it up real quick. Let's look it up. Let's see what we got. Uh, so, okay. What it called philosophy and theurgy and late antiquity. Philosophy and theurgy and late antiquity. Uh, there it is. Uh, the ancient philosophy and its original Orphico Pythagorean and Platonic form is not simply a way of life in accordance with the divine and human intellect news, but also a way about chemical transformation and mystical illumination achieved through initiatic death and subsequent restoration at the level of divine light as a means of spiritual um, reintegration, unification. Ancient philosophy is inseparable from the Hariatic rites. The theurgic animation of statues appears to be among the main keys for understanding how various royal and priestly practices related to the daily ritual service and encounter with the divine presence in the temples developed into Neoplatonic mysticism of late antiquity. Interesting. Yeah. So it focuses on here. I'll put this on um, well, paperback. I don't do Kindle. And then I'll put it to add list. There we go. I got a bunch on that list, but thank you very much, uh, Gia. I will definitely take that in a uh, note and I will potentially get that and read that. So thank you very much, brother, for the $20 super chat. I truly do appreciate it. God bless you. Next one came from Willie Jenkins threw in $5 said, wear them t-shirts though. Uh, t-shirts are on the website. So all you got to do is go to here. Let's do it. Um, I'll show you guys my t-shirts so you can go to, so here you go. 
this is you just go to shop on my website you click on shop there's the one-on-one -on -one session they're sponsoring a stream we got hats i got hats here we got bags with the uh, cavalry cross on it if you guys want bags we got that over at the website again the, the cool cavalry cross um a variety of different t-shirts here's the black and white cavalry cross if you are down so uh willie jenkins these are the t-shirts bro i've i've had them you just just check out the website um you can also again you got different colors there you go to the next page you can here's a unique logo of mine so got church logo that is um saint basil's cathedral in saint Petersburg, russia see got church logos um you can get the uh nika shirt uh this would be a great shirt i may i may take one of these to uh montanica right montanica um <clears throat> Um, so you can get one of those, uh, here is the Lord's prayer in Arabic. Um, so if you're down for that, this is, uh, this is the Lord's prayer, Christian Lord's prayer in, in Arabic. I thought it looked pretty sick. Um, so I was down with that. Um, There's some socks, T-shirts, coffee mugs. Um, and then here is my uh, – here's just my Royal Ortho Cross. I actually love this shirt. Not very popular. Not very popular, but I like it. So anyways, uh, William Jenkins, if you're, if you're down, bro, I got shirts. I need to get more shirts. I agree with that. I could definitely get more shirts. Um, but this one's probably my favorite, the Calvary cross, and it's got the Russian around it and the Greek, you know, I C X C. So yeah, check it out, bro. Uh, I hope you like that. Uh, let me know what you think. But anyways, brother, thank you so much for the $5 super chat. And thank you for continuing to be a YouTube member, Willie Jenkins. God bless you, bro. Thank you so much, man. I really do appreciate it. Um, moving over to some of the super chats over on uh, Streamlabs. Let me change this over. And let's go through some of those. Um, Amp Town throws in ten dollars and says for your bigger shell fund yeah i definitely need that shout out to amp town my sister god bless you i hope you're doing well she goes to my church so we know each other personally god bless you amp town thank you so much for the ten dollar super chat you're always so generous and supportive uh looking forward to seeing you again on sunday thank you so much i definitely do need a bigger shelf and so um i have books everywhere i got a i got uh what is it six and a half foot I think it's six or seven foot shelves. I got one there fully stacked, one there fully stacked, a three foot, three and a half or three foot shelf fully stacked. This one's fully stacked. I got a table full of books and I got books all over the ground over there. So I love books. I really, really love books. I do need another uh, seven foot bookshelf so I can fill that up. I probably have enough to fill it up. But uh, thank you so much, Amp Town. God bless you, sister. Truly do appreciate it. Um, next one came in from AC, our brother AC throwed in $5. Let me take that banner down so we can see that. Um, and he says, Albert Dreuer's night death and the devil show the prelest of the reformation and the night leaves the city of prayer. We know in the Philokalia, uh, Nietzsche and Paul Tillich uphold it triumphantly. Okay. Let's look it up. Albert Dreuer's um albert drewer let's get out of here
What was it? Albert Drewer. Night Death and the Devil. Oh, that's a great work. Yeah, so Albert Drewer, again, the most important artist of the German Renaissance. We can see the devil over here. We can see time, Kronos. We can see the, the soldier um, at work, the white horse. I'm sure that's a, an appeal to the book of Revelation. Let's find the biggest version we can find. So a lot of a lot of these works again had like secret symbolism. So right here, like again, if you had eyes to see, all this stuff would mean something. The lizard would mean something. Um, I guess Satan is over here on a horse. It's heads down, his heads up. So all this stuff means something if you know what you're looking at. I do not know what I'm looking at. So I, I am not a aficionado to know what I'm looking at. But I do appreciate the super chat by AC saying, again, looking at this particular writing, says, Abba Drewer's Night Death and the Devil show the prelest of the Reformation and the night leaves the city of prayer we know of in the Philokalia. Nietzsche and Paul Tillich uphold it triumphantly. <laughs> great, great uh, comment, AC. Thank you so much, brother. I do appreciate it for the $5 super chat. God bless you, man, and thanks for supporting all the work here. I do appreciate it. Next one comes from George. George throws in $3, and he says, What a great stream. Back when I was interested in joining these types of organizations, I'm an ortho bro now, thank God. There was a big contingent of Rosicrucians in Milwaukee where I lived at the time. Do you, it says, do you nothing, anything about the grotto and what they believe? Do you know anything about the grotto and what they believe? I'm not sure what exactly you mean by the grotto. Are you talking about uh, the burial of Christian Rosenkreuz? where it claimed that there's a, there was a lamp that was burning and it's never gone out. Is that what you mean? I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, unfortunately, brother, um, what exactly you mean, George, if you're here in the live chat, feel free to throw in a comment and you can clarify for me. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. So I apologize, but yeah, I guess maybe I don't know anything about the grow the grotto and what they believe. I mean, I feel like I know a lot about what Rosicrucians believe, but I'm not familiar about the specific grotto you're talking about. But George, thank you so much, brother, for the three dollar super chat. I do appreciate it. Next one comes from No Cap. Well, that's good. Don't be capping, bro. Uh, no Cap throws in one dollar and says, "What do you think of Michael Hearn and his memes and any progress on the Elliot Holt collab, J collab?" Well, Jay and I collab all the time, um, no cap. So if you put in Jay Dyer, there's multiple. I think we've had six streams, seven streams together. Um, Mike O'Hearn. I like Mike O'Hearn. Um, you know, the whole Natty thing, I'm not sure about that. Obviously, I don't think he is. Now he admits he's on TRT. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Mike O'Hearn. This is Mike O'Hearn. Uh, he is 54 years old. 54 years old. Looks like that. So he's incredible. He's in incredible shape. I hope I look something like that when I'm 54. Um, but uh, yeah, he's definitely not natty. He admits it now. I think the memes are hilarious. I, I, I share some of them over on my Instagram. So I think they're pretty funny. Um, any progress on the Elliott Holtz collab? No progress there. No progress there. Um, but um, I hope that when I get back from Germany, I'll try again to reach out to Elliot Hulse and see if I can do a collab with him. That would be great. I'd be really excited for that. Um, 
<clears throat> yeah, uh, JC Owen says, uh, dude, Mike has been on gear since American Gladiator. Well, you know, I, I don't, I don't disagree. I really don't take a pin, opinion on it. Yeah, yeah. Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. Exactly. Thank you, Mister uh, Smirks. Um. Um. Oh, dang. Soon Kim th donates five memberships, shares five members. Dang, shout out to Soon Kim, man. God bless you, bro. Thank you so much, man. I hope that um I hope you're able to to catch some of the stream, brother, and I hope you enjoyed it. Welcome, welcome everybody to uh to becoming members. Welcome all the new members. Welcome Evangel Evangelium. Welcome uh, Radical Geek. Welcome Solomon. Welcome the Interdimensional Wizard Andrew. Um, welcome all you guys. Gosh, we got so many freaking members now in the in the in the chat. Welcome David G. Dang, thank you so much, Soon Kim, for gifting more memberships. God bless you, bro. Dang. Um. Yeah. Uh, has he been on gear since the gladiator? Maybe. Uh, I was gonna say he graduated high school weighing like two hundred and um, like sixty pounds. So the thing about gear is Michael Hearn isn't actually that much bigger than he was when he graduated high school, which I think plays in his favor that he was natty for a long period. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't really have a claim. I just know when you look at people who are on gear, you can't stay on gear all the time. And so the fact that he's maintained his physique for a long period plays in his favor. The fact that he hasn't gotten that much bigger plays in his favor, but I don't know. It's incredible how that dude's so fit and, and he's in, he's 54 now. So I don't know. He now admits that he's on TRT. So that's, that's a good one. But Anyways, uh, oh, shout out to Kristen. She said, way past my bedtime. I'm cutting out on the super chats. Good night, Kotal chat gangs. Good night, Kristen. God bless you and the family. Wish you guys nothing but the best. Get your beauty rest. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Super chat came in from Vladimir Kranyik, throws in uh 550 Canadian. Thank you for your work. Well, thank you, brother, for your support. I truly do appreciate that. God bless you. Um, okay. Let's get back to some of these, uh, super chats over here. Uh, okay. Next super chat came in from George. No, we read George's. No, we did not read George. George threw in another super chat. Um, I also have a question unrelated to night stream. I've been a fan of America first for a bit now, but I'm kind of concerned about the tenuous connection to Milo, Ali, and yay support of Valenciaga. Do you have thoughts or have a better political option? Thanks, dude. Yeah. Um, in regards to political options, I don't believe there is one. So, um, you know, for me, I think it's pretty much over. Um, so I don't think America First is going to do much. Do I support America? Of course I do. Absolutely. Um, I'm very skeptical of America first. I think Nick Fuentes is a very, uh, neotenized individual. Um, is he articulate? Sure. Is it, can he talk? Is he, you know, his stuff about politics? Sure. I'll give him that. But, um, I think the idea that he views himself as a Stalin figure, as a Napoleon figure, as a Hitler figure. I mean, the dude has little man syndrome in my opinion. Um, you look at their movement and how many people are married? How many of the men have children? How many of the men like run their own business? How many of the men are respectable people in their communities? I'm not a big fan of America first. My, my own opinion, not that I'm not for America first in the philosophical sense. Of course I am, but, um, do I think that they're going to do anything or save us? No, I think that, uh, again, the whole Ali Alexander thing I think is reprehensible. I'm no supporter of Milo. I'm very questionable about him and his heterosexuality. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm very 
conflicted. I don't know how much uh, uh, Catholicism, um, you know, that uh, Fuentes is, is a part of. I don't know. I don't know, man. I think it's tenuous. Tenuous. I don't have a real strong opinion on that. Um, but yeah, that's my general general take is I'm very skeptical of the America First movement. Yeah, J.C. Owen says America First was doomed from the start because they are playing a losing game using rules that don't apply to the game they are playing. Yeah, yeah. Theoria's own. He says I think it's all a psyop. To be honest, it could be. It could be. Hey, night, y'all. Night, AC. Thanks a lot, brother. Appreciate the support. God bless you, man. And um, yeah. So. AC said it was doomed to start. They're playing a game by other rules. Yeah, I don't think a politics is going to save us. I think only Christ is going to save you. And I just don't see them as like strong traditional Christian men myself. Um, would I follow any of them into battle? No. That's basically my p political metric now at this point, George. Um, if I don't think I can follow you into battle, not really concerned about politics at this point. But Anyways, George, I appreciate the support, brother. God bless you. <laughs> Wild keeper. That's funny. He says politics is faker than Rosicrucianism. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Well, I'm going to hop off here. God bless all of you. I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you so much for all the supporters. Thank you to Vladimir. Thank you to George. Shout out to No Cap. Shout out to um, AC. Shout out to our Amp Town One. And shout out to uh, Willie Jenkins, uh, Giab, Pottery in Central Washington, and AC. God bless all you guys. I wish you nothing but the best. And I will be back Thursday night with Father Deacon Dr. Ananias doing a good, the bad, and the ugly on humanism. So I hope to see you all there. Until always, God bless. <laughs>